You are watching DHTV from California State University, Dominguez Hills. Right on schedule. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Buenos dias, estimado público. We're going to start the program, folks. Please take your seats. I'm Frank Motek from CBS Radio here in Los Angeles, KNX 1070, providing you the money reports and also hosts of Motek on Money. This is where the big news is today, so that's where we are here today. Thank you for joining us for this important discussion today. The CSUDH South Bay Economic Forecast. It's an honor to be back here on the Cal State Dominguez Hills campus. Today we're going to be focusing on a region in transition changes and trends in consumer behavior and get a good look at the economy and all the exciting things happening nowadays. It's an honor to be with you because I'm also eager to hear from our speakers here this morning about the changing trends in consumer behavior. Consumers changing the way we do things, the way we shop, the way we eat, the way we travel, the way we transport, and so many other ways that our tech devices now allow us to do. More and more folks, consumers are sharing all sorts of things in the so-called sharing economy. With just a credit card and a smartphone, we can share vehicles, wedding dresses, sailboats, RVs, bikes, and even clothing and accessories. So I'm excited to hear from the exceptional lineup of speakers we have here today who will share their insights about the many changes and trends in consumer behavior. But first, let's acknowledge the fantastic sponsors who've helped support this important occasion. First of all, huge thanks to our gold sponsors, which include Pacific Century Customer Services, SA Recycling, and many thanks to our silver sponsors here as well. Thank you for your support of this program. I'd like to take this opportunity to recognize the following elected officials who are here this morning. Mayor Albert Robles from the city of Carson, Councilmember Juwan Hilton from the city of Carson, Councilmember James Van Dever, who is currently serving as mayor of the city of Palos Verdes Estates. Mayor Patrick Fury from the city of Torrance. Councilmember Heidi Ashcroft from the city of Torrance. And Councilmember Milton Herring from the city of Torrance. Let's please have a nice round of applause for our elected folks who are here in the audience this morning. And thank you very much for joining us. Today's program will be in three parts. We'll hear presentations on housing and commuting trends here in Southern California, followed by trends in foreign-owned businesses. And then we'll hear the complete South Bay Economic Forecast Report by Dr. Robert Kleinhans of Beacon Economics. And we'll culminate the morning with a five-speaker panel who will discuss the various changes in the behavior of you, the consumer. But before we dive into the program, folks, it's now an honor to introduce the host of today's economic forecast, the president of California State University, Dominguez Hills, Dr. Willie Hagan. And for those of you who have not met the president, he joined the university as the 10th president in the year 2012. Since his arrival, he has actively worked to expand partnerships with local businesses and organizations, ensuring that the campus is meeting workforce demands in this region. And today's event is an example of his ongoing interest to ensure that Cal State University Dominguez Hills can serve as a resource to the broader South Bay region, as well as educating more than 15,000 students who are consumers and huge contributors to the changes in consumer behavior. It's now an honor and pleasure to invite President Willie J. Hagan to the stage to deliver the official welcome. On behalf of the university, please welcome the Honorable Willie J. Hagan. Well, thank you. I think it's the first time I've been called the Honorable. Uh, I've been called a lot of things. Uh, but first of all, you know, again, thank you for all being here. Um, it, it's good to have uh, so many new visitors to Cal State Dominguez Hills and to see so many people who've been here uh, before. If you are new, we hope you get a chance to go around our campus and get a chance to, you know, see it and interact with people. So we're very proud of the stuff that we're doing here. Uh, but before I start, um, I want to thank a number of people who I, you know, make this event what it is. First of all, as you heard, I want to thank Dr. Robert Kleinhens. Uh, he's the economist for Beacon Economics and his team for their work in developing the 2017-18 uh, forecast. And he's sitting over here with our speaker's table, so thank you very much. 
I also want to thank a very distinguished group of uh, panels uh, and speakers here. I'm always impressed when the, my staff lets me know who has agreed to come here and be part of this. Um, there are some uh, great speakers here. And again, I want to thank you. And we have uh, Dr. Christine Cooper, Regional Economist for CoStar, Giancarlo Filartiga, uh, Vice President of Development with uh, Mesa Ridge Real Estate, Sean Gold, Corporate Marketing Officer with Textile, Daniel Duran, Professor at Whittier College, and Kyle Ransford, CEO with Chef. And of course, as you heard, we're fortunate as always to have as our moderator, uh, Frank Motek, uh, anchor of KNX 1070 News Radio Business Hour. And while we're all over there just chatting and not paying attention, when his voice rang out, uh, instantly recognized when I knew it was time to go to work. So we thank you for being here again for us. And lastly, I want to do a uh, special thanks to the uh, conference organizers, including uh, Dean Joseph Wynn, the Dean of our College of Business Administration and Public Policy, Carrie Stewart, our Vice President. I saw the Dean somewhere out there earlier, uh, oh, over there. And uh, I want to thank them and their entire team uh, for putting this conference together. It's a, uh, an endeavor of, uh, of love uh, for this region and for uh, this university. So I really appreciate all the effort that went into this. Well, first of all, let me say we're very pleased to partner with Beacon Economics uh, to present this uh, forecast focused on the South Bay. We think this is important to you as this region's business and industry leaders, but we also think it's very important for us as the four-year university in the South Bay region. Uh, all of us, we are linked by the flow of resource and information that's critical to our mutual success. And one of our most critical resources are the people, both the students on this campus, the people who are your customer base, and your next generation of workers. And the success of our pre-kindergarten programs, our K through 12 schools, the regional community colleges, and our four-year colleges will determine the success of your business and your industries and the success of the South Bay region. So um, as the president, I, I have to brag about a few things. So, but I'm only gonna identify four things that I wanna uh, indicate that we are doing that will strengthen our university, but we also think will contribute significantly to the workforce and the economy of the South Bay region. And these are things that uh, we're very proud of, and they've all happened uh, within the last uh, several months. On September 28th, we broke ground on our $82 million science and innovation building. This 91,000 square foot facility will house the university's growing STEM programs and provide critical learning and laboratory and collaboration space. This building will include a Center for Innovation and in STEM Education, which is funded by a $4 million gift for, to, by the Toyota Foundation, and we appreciate that. Uh, and I should add, STEM, for those who aren't uh, in this field, stands for science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. This building is going to serve our students and our faculty, and it's going to serve the needs of our regional workforce. We're very proud of that. Equally important, on September 27th, we unveiled the first of four STEM mobile fabrication laboratories. A mobile fabrication laboratory is exactly what it sounds like. A mobile laboratory filled with scientific equipment from 3D printers, laser cutters, computer control, milling machines, routers, and many other uh, scientific pieces of equipment. These um, mobile fabs, uh, we have one now, and we'll have a total of four shortly. And they were funded by a $1 million gift from Toyota and a $300,000 grant from the Keck Foundation. These labs are going to traverse the surrounding school districts. We're going to bring high-tech laboratory experiences and concepts to elementary and middle school students to help stimulate their imagination, interest, and pursuit of STEM careers at a young age. Because as you all know, if you don't get kids interested in the sciences, mathematics at a young age, it's very hard as they get older to get them into those fields that are really important to the uh, businesses that are growing in this area. We also have a received approval, and we're still negotiating this, but we've received overall approval and are going to soon engage architects and contractors to begin work on a new cutting-edge classroom building, which is going to also be the home of our College of Business Administration and Public Policy. And that also is going to be a facility that's going to service the campus, but also the region. Um, we have a no number of examples of things that we do that benefit the campus, the students, our mission, but we also think contribute significantly to our, our role as supporting what's happening in uh, this area. Uh, we have a Hollywood by the Horns program. And that program is aimed at providing a more diverse population of storytellers and practitioners entering the entertainment business. We have a partnership with the Port of LA and our global logistics program designed to expand the number of students graduating with degrees and experience in global logistics. And as we look to grow additional partnerships and opportunities that have an economic impact which support our academic mission, we are utilizing what we believe is one of the most valuable assets in this region, which is our land. 
On September 20th, the Board of Trustees unanimously approved our concept plan for University Village. And we will soon be issuing an RFP to potential developers as we're doing the environmental work. This 76-acre, $1.2 billion development will include faculty, staff, student, and market rate housing, mixed-use retail, a park, a 30 acres set aside for a business park that will be the source of internships, faculty research opportunities, and revenue to support our mission. And as aside from my remarks, if you're interested in uh, being part of our business park, uh, talk to me afterwards. <laughs> we believe it's going to, again, positively impact our campus, the city, and the uh, South Bay economy. But this is a welcome. So let me end my remarks again by noting the importance of an economic forecast for the South Bay region. That is one of the purposes, excuse me, one of the things I tell my students all the time during commencement is that they have to learn how to survive and thrive in a world of uncertainty. And the same is true of you. Business, like life, can be full of risk in uncharted territories. This is one of the purposes of this economic forecast. I think business author Cullen Roach said it best in an article he wrote about pragmatic capitalism. He said, regarding economic forecasting, it's sort of like preparing to sail across an ocean. You would never claim to be able to predict the weather or conditions you might encounter, but you can understand your path, you can understand the potential weather patterns and how your vessel operates so you can increase the odds that you will make it there in one piece. This is how we see our role and why we do what we do in terms of uh, putting on these forecasts. We want to help illuminate your path and help you identify potential economic weather patterns to increase the odds of you and your business arriving in one piece. We want to continue working with all of you to truly make a difference in the lives of our students, our community, and the South Bay region. And the last thing I'm going to say is something that it was about a half hour ago that I decided I would add in. It bears no relationship uh, you know, to this workshop per se, but college presidents, you sometimes go off on tangents. Um, and a number of the folks in this room have heard this before, but you know, it's a quote that I end all of my commencements with. And while I think it's important advice for students, I was thinking about this group and I said, eh, it might be useful for them here as well. It's a quote from Hunter S. Thompson. It goes like this. Life should not be a journey to the grave with the intention of arriving safely in a pretty and well-preserved body, but rather to skid in broadside in a cloud of smoke, thoroughly used up, totally worn out, and loudly proclaiming, wow, what a ride. The fiduciary responsibilities that you have for your life are as important, if not more important, for the fiduciary responsibilities you have for your business. So I urge you in both cases, life and work, live it in such a way that at the end, when you look back, you too can say, wow, what a ride. Thank you. Thank you very much, President Hagan, and congratulations on all those exciting announcements here on the campus like to announce, remember in the olden days, they used to say, well, put away your blackberries and you know, put, it, put them away. But things have changed over the years, of course. If anything, we would encourage you to take out your iPhone, most likely, right, and get some photos of this event and post to social media. An event is not an event unless it's on social media nowadays. So our hashtag is CSUDH forecast, CSUDH forecast. The Handle here is at Dominguez Hills, and if you want to add it, Frank Motek, I'll be happy to retweet you as well. I would like to acknowledge the CSU Dominguez Hills students who are here today in an effort to encourage more research around economic issues. Dominguez Hills hosted a research competition, and the following students not only won the accolades of their faculty, but also a $200 prize as well. So please join me in congratulating Nikki Wynn, Kat Torres, Cheyenne Luna, Shale Garland, Hawk McFadzen, Melissa Tolosa, Andre Cachaturians, Shirley Jones, Judith Talamantes, and Gloria Martinez. Congratulations to the winning students who are present here today. And a quick business update. We see all the major stock market averages at all-time highs this morning. Tayeb Shabir, the professor of finance and chair of the Department of Finance, is with us. So congratulations on doing your part, to professor, to pump up the economy and uh, the stock market with your presence here this morning. And now, ladies and gentlemen, our first speaker, Dr. Jose Martinez, the co-director of the Economics Institute here at CSU Dominguez Hills. He currently teaches financial forecasting, microeconomic and macroeconomic principles and international business within the accounting, finance, and economics department here at 
CSU Dominguez Hills. Now, his research interests are labor economics, applied micro-migration, crime, and time series econometrics. Please join me in welcoming to the stage Dr. Jose Martinez. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks a lot for the invitation. This is truly a pressure. Um, I'm here to talk about uh, two of the area's biggest problems, uh, housing and commuting times. It actually reminds me of a joke that I heard uh, recently from one of my colleagues. That's what we do all the time. Um, <laughs> he, he said that uh, guys are the doctors and say, doctor, my wife has a real problem. She's going deaf. And the doctor said, how serious it is? I don't know. Well, go home and try to speak to her from a distance to try to figure out. He goes home, opens the door, and the wife is at the kitchen, not my joke, and it, it screams, honey, what's for dinner? No response. Gets closer, honey, what's for dinner? No response. Gets closer, honey, what's for dinner? No response. He starts to get really worried, so this is a serious problem. Gets right behind her and says, honey, what's for dinner? The wife turns around and says, Lasagna, I already told you three times. <laughs> so what I'm, trying to, what I'm trying to say is that sometimes things are a little bit different than they appear. <laughs> Why do we have uh, rising housing costs and uh, long commutes? It's in part is because the area is attractive. This is an attractive area for residents. We have beautiful weather, we have nice people like this group. We have um, even, we have two football games, football teams, so this is a great area. For workers, uh, a lot of jobs are in this area. And we've finally seen some wage increases, so very attractive for workers, but also for employers. Employers uh, see this area as an excellent location. We have an access, close access to LAX and the ports and also access to human capital, which is the workers, our students. So, and also access to uh, local clusters and networks like financial services, aerospace, biomedical, trade and manufacturing. So this is a very attractive area and that's why maybe in part we see those rising prices and long commutes. So now to talk about uh, housing in the area, um, maybe you remember from previous years, uh, we, s we re-splitted the South Bay into coastal communities and inland communities. And the main reason is because they behave very differently. We have the SB1 and SB2. SB1 is the coastal communities, including Torrance, of course, and SB2 uh, for the inland communities. And so what are some of the demand factors for housing in the South Bay? Of course, one of them is jobs. There's a lot of jobs in the area and the forecast is for even more jobs in the near future. So for this particular area, we see that the main industries in terms of the number of jobs for the South Bay are the professional business service, retail and wholesale trade, manufacturing, leisure and hospitality, healthcare and transportation and utilities. But the largest growth in the last five years has been in leisure and hospitality, healthcare, transportation utilities, professional business services. One thing to note is that for leisure and hospitality and healthcare, they tend to have wages below the average for the region. So good news, bad news. Another demand factor in the price is the price of alternatives, in this case, the price of rentals. And the evidence is that in the recent history, there has been significant growth in rental prices, which in the near future, they might become financial problems to a lot of people, a lot of households. The recommendation is always not to spend more than 30% of the income on housing. But as you can see here, especially for inland communities in the South Bay, uh, about 30% uh, residents spend more than 50% of their income in housing. That could lead to some serious problems like homelessness in the future. 
according to some research from Silo, uh, they predict that uh, about 2,000 more homeless people if rents increase by 5% in the area. Well, 5% sounds very doable, so we should expect in the near future a bigger problem with more homelessness. Uh, another factor is uh, credit availability and regulations, and there's anecdotal evidence that uh, credit and regulation have become more, a little bit more relaxing recently, which is good for housing. But if you consider millennials, which is a very large group in terms of population, and you add the unaffordability issue, then that leads to the conclusion that there's going to be very few mobility in the area in the housing market. So now let's talk about the supply factors. And the supply factors uh, include building permits, new construction, and supply of existing home for sales. And all of them point to very low and, and inadequate supply of housing in the South Bay. Uh, one thing to note, and this is for, uh, for California in general, California represents about 12 to 13 percent of the U.S. population, but only 8 percent of all new residential buildings and 22 percent of the homeless population. Is there a correlation there? Sure. Is there a causation? Well, we need to research a little bit more. Uh, but if you look at uh, coastal communities, the percentage of new residential buildings is even smaller. So some people argue that a potential solution might be more affordable and multifamily housing, but one thing to know is that it really there are some communities that are doing a true effort to prevent that and to restrict how much affordable and multifamily housing is developed. Another supply factor for housing is the dynamic interaction between population groups. Uh, what is to be expected is that millennials, being the young group, are expected to sooner or later become first-time buyers, right? They buy a fixer-upper. And the other groups are a little bit older. They move to better and larger homes. And the baby boomers are expected to move into smaller properties as they retire. And that is not happening. So boomers are staying longer in the large homes, and that can create a trickle-down effect on other groups, too. So what do we see in terms of prices and sales in the South Bay? Uh, for, the in, for the coastal communities, they tend to be more expensive, even in price per square foot terms. And uh, we see healthy growth for sales recently, mainly in inland communities. And the forecast is pretty much for no growth in sales due to more restricted supply mainly. So that's what we forecast in terms of sales, no growth. But in terms of prices, uh, we see very healthy growth in average prices recently and even in percentage uh, in, in price per square foot. And also, and forecasted increases are healthy but somewhat more moderate for next year. So still growth in uh, housing prices in the area. So these are some of the uh, summary for this uh, section. Uh, one thing to note is that uh, there's some California legislation bills, SB2 and SB35, that might help the issue with affordable and multifamily housing, but there's no silver, silver bullet to fix the problem here. Um, and now to uh, live feed from the 91. <laughs> uh, we are, to talk about commuting times, we noticed that uh, a few things. When we look at uh, the commute of, of uh, people in California, workers in California, LA County, and some cities in the South Bay, and we noticed that most people drive alone, and public transportation is lower in the South Bay. And also, the people that drive alone tend to receive higher earnings. So that explains maybe why they can afford to drive by themselves. And also, people who drive alone have shorter commutes, but that could be due to reverse causation. Maybe it's because they work in a shorter distance, so they don't have to commute with other people. 
one interesting finding comparing changes in the data from 2005 to 2010 and from 2010 to 15 is that people are carpooling less. Maybe it could be because the marginal benefit of carpooling is going down. If you're driving, I drive in the 91, if you look at the carpool lane, it's, sometimes it's even worse than the regular lane, so maybe that's why. Also, commute times continue to climb, but a little bit faster when the economy is going well. So that's part of the problem or the blessing if you wanna see it different way. Uh, we noticed that uh, where this is our, our hypothesis is that there might be two types of commuters, one that do it for by choice and the other ones by necessity, and we plan to do a little bit more research on this. Not, not everybody commutes for the same reasons, basically. So what can we do about this problem of long commutes? Some people suggest that we should invest more in, in public transit, like this example is the Expo Line, and it's true. If you build it, more people use it, and rideshare it has been going up, which is a really good thing. Uh, but also, uh, there's some studies that suggest minimal impact on freeway and local street congestion. So basically, that points to the law of eternal congestion, which economists call that uh, induced demand. Basically, when you increase the supply of something, people will demand more of it. So that's a pretty simple principle. And also, uh, the price increases are going up because in the area where they have this new uh, investment, but also we're seeing low-income neighbors have been uh, gentrified, which is not a good thing. So to finish, I wanna point out to some um, results of a poll by UC Berkeley that talk about this idea of rising housing costs and whether people are thinking about moving. And when I saw this, the first thing to consider is like moving, like moving where? Your house is more expensive, but your neighbors went up even more. So there's no place to move, right? So now going back to the question, uh, they also ask how serious do you think is the problem of housing affordability in your area? And they ask uh, California registered voters, voters. And in California, 48% said that it's a serious, very serious problem in California. In LA, 42%. And in San Francisco area, 65% people. They thought that it was a serious problem. But the interesting fact is about the question, have you given any consideration to moving because of rising costs of housing in your area? For all California, the response was yes for 56%. For LA, 59%. And interesting, for San Francisco, what do you think? Lower than LA, 51%. So if people in San Francisco are not moving, why should I? So, <laughs> so now that gives me, uh, it gives me a lot of pleasure to introduce the other co-director of the Economics Institute, Dr. Finwin Prager. Dr. Prager is an assistant professor of public administration here at Dominguez Hills. His research includes, uh, interests include policy and economics of disasters particularly environmental and terrorism policy and the impacts to regional economies and transportation systems. Please welcome Dr. Prager to the stage as he presents on foreign-owned businesses here in the South Bay. Dr. Prager. Thank you. It's a nice experience being up on stage here next to this plant. So hello everyone, it's a real pleasure to be up here again, a great honor. Thank you so much for coming, we really appreciate it. And I just wanna extend my special thank you to President Hagen for all the support that you provided to the Institute and to the college. You'll be really missed by everyone in our college, I know that for sure. So today I'm gonna to talk about foreign direct investment and foreign trade related to the South Bay. A quick thank you to Dr. Martinez and our excellent research assistant, Carlos Catan, for their fine work on this project. 
And we also really appreciate the support of our new economics lecturer, Dr. Shireen Elhag. Uh, foreign investment and trade can sometimes seem a bit dry, right? A bit boring. And just in case you're under any false impressions, given the talent and wit of Jose, we're actually all geeks here. We're all nerds at the South Bay Economics Institute, and we love to dig deep into the data, so we're really comfortable with dry here. <laughs> we're also interested in the bigger picture, though. And here, the bigger picture is to highlight the benefits of foreign investment and foreign trade to our region. And moreover, to highlight the benefits of diversity and intercultural dialogue and learning from one another. These are all core principles of Dominguez Hills, which is among the most ethnically diverse universities in the United States. For example, immigrants and visa students on our campus represent over 100 different countries. And at the South Bay Economics Institute, we're immigrants. We came here and we love it. But this isn't just a woolly talk about, oh, this, uh, this might be the wrong slide deck. Um, about to make us feel good. In this talk, I'll show that foreign firms contribute substantially to the South Bay in terms of jobs, GDP, and taxes. They also support our colleges. So as was just talked about, the new science, technology, engineering, and mathematics building on this campus was supported in part by Toyota. They're also supporting the Fab Labs that we're taking around to middle schools in the area to promote ed um, engineering education. Another example, Nitori, a furniture firm, from Japan, they sponsor a scholarship on campus. So if any of you are interested in spo sponsoring uh, scholarships, we're very welcome to, uh, we'd, you'd be very welcome to contact us. Also, cities with high foreign-owned enterprise concentrations appear to perform better. Foreign direct investment and trade are not always linked, though. So foreign direct investment tends to come from developed nations as opposed to our common trading partners, especially in the area of foreign-owned enterprises. And most of all, foreign-owned businesses are happy here in Southern California. They don't want to move away like our residents, some of them. So before we dig into the numbers, um, you can tell I'm a professor because I like a quiz. So which foreign countries have the most enterprises here in the South Bay? Shout out. Japan, that's right, with 370 firms that employ 17,429 employees and pay an estimated 1.13 billion in wages. And second, I hear China, any others? You'll be surprised by this. It's the UK with 67 firms that pay, and that's in the South Bay, pay 6,543 uh, 6, employees and estimated 371 million in wages. And third, China, it's Germany, with 54 firms employing 5,712 people with an estimated total pay of 367 million. So nearly, I'll just go on one, nearly all of these firms are in the wholesale and retail trade sectors, and a further 119 are in transportation and warehousing, and another 100 in manufacturing. So these, not, these firms are not only Japanese car makers or Irish bars, which I was expecting. <laughs> so as you can see, overall, 765 foreign-owned firms contribute over 43,000 jobs to the South Bay economy and pay an estimated 2.67 billion in wages. So we were wondering why these particular countries, you know, what the, before we started this project, we thought, well, it must be to do, there must be something to do with trade, right? There must be some connection there. But the, and after all, lots of studies have shown that firms start trading with a new country and then, you know, basically to test the waters. And then if they find a market, they establish a presence there. But if you look at the imports and exports, and this is just a select group of countries, China is clearly the biggest trading partner of the South Bay. These are all the imports and exports coming through South Bay ports like LAX, um, the two... LA and Long Beach um, water ports. Japan is, is quite far behind. There's other Asian countries that I've not included on this slide. So even though Chinese companies are a major trading partner, they have relatively little presence in the South Bay. 
or even in Southern California, actually. So maybe there's a lag effect here. Maybe China's presence here will continue to grow over the next 10 years. Um, and in 10 years' time, we'll see a very different foreign-owned enterprise picture in the region. Or maybe such investments are no longer necessary as our supply chains have changed and the communications that we um, rely on have radically changed since China's emergence as a major trading partner. Either way, it's clear that the top foreign investor countries are all developed nations. And while many trading partners such as China and Mexico are, um, are they're not present in our foreign-owned business um, picture. So we're also interested in looking how these companies are clustered, how they're located and, and agglomerated within our region. And this is a really important aspect of our region, but also particularly this campus. So this campus is built on the same site as where the 1910 air show took place in, um, in 1910 at Dominguez Hills. And that very much sparked the aerospace industry, which has become such an important um, legacy in our, in our local economy. Firms cluster together because of their lower transaction costs. They see there is a market for their goods. They know that, that, there's talented, that there are talented job seekers around, and they hope to gain from those business alliances and networks, as well as possible no knowledge spillovers. And all this is great for the consumer. It re reduces their consumer uh, transaction costs. It reduces prices. And it also allows them to search for the best value products to meet their budgets. So in the same way that aerospace firms benefited and pro proliferated in Southern California, our hypothesis is that foreign firms are doing the same thing. They're entering the South Bay to do more than just gain a foothold in the US market, although that's really important. They also want to access the talented labor pool and learn from and network with local companies here. And at first glance, this does appear to be happening. In the South Bay, as you can see from this graphic, the foreign-owned enterprise firms are, the most, are most strongly clustered in Torrance there and El Segundo to the north. And we ran statistical analyses for the Southern California region as a whole and found that cities with high foreign-owned enterprise concentrations have larger labor forces, lower unemployment rates, higher sales, more workers, and a higher three-year growth rate in sales volumes. In other words, Southern California cities with many um, foreign-owned enterprises appear to be benefiting from this clustering. We should also point out that foreign-owned enterprises seeking to invest in the region might benefit by lo locating in areas with high concentrations of foreign-owned firms already, like the South Bay. So again, the bigger picture here is that foreign direct investment appears to benefit not only the firms in it and the industry and their customers, but also the economies and cities around them. Now, of course, there's a chicken and egg issue here, right? Causation, correlation, which came first, the South Bay economy or the foreign investment? And we can't answer that with the data that we've got here, but what is interesting is that when we looked back to um, the data from 10 years ago, the same countries were in this region, and there's been relatively little change in the ranking, which suggests that foreign companies are part of the fabric of our region and contributing to that growth. So these findings are part of a broader project that the South Bay Economics Institute conducted for the World Trade Center Los Angeles. For this study, we sent surveys out to or interviewed more than 9,000 front-end enterprises. We didn't interview all of them. We sent surveys out to all of them. Um, we really appreciate the work of numerous fine Dominguez Hill students supporting this project. And there's lots of good news here. So first, most reported having positive experiences in the region. Second, only small numbers plan to relocate outside of the region. Third, when asked about potential investment locations, Southern California was the most popular, especially Lo Los Angeles County. And if they were interested in relocating outside of California, major population centers such as Texas and New York were particularly appealing within the US, and Asian markets in Canada were appealing internationally. Now, the bad news is that there are major concerns for front-end enterprises, and those are trade investment restrictions and delays for um, business visas. So to finish up, if you were here last year, you may recall that we, um, at the South Bay Economics Institute, are building a, an economic impact model for the South Bay. And we ran what would look like a 10% reduction in foreign-owned enterprises through this model for the top 10, 11 sectors excuse me, listed here. 
um, to see what, would, what the impacts would be economically. In other words, what if 10% of these firms were to suddenly leave the region for whatever reason, moving to other states or repatriating elsewhere for some reason, which I might add, it, the survey data does not suggest is gonna happen. This is just hypothetical. We estimate that such a scenario would result in roughly 1% reduction in output, GDP, and unemployment across the South Bay. So while they're just hypothetical results, that really shows the importance of these companies to the region. They're having a, an important economic impact. So thank you very, oh, excuse me, next presentation. Thank you very much for your time. <laughs> we at the South Bay Economics Institute very much look forward to collaborating with you and to serving the region. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Prager, Dr. Martinez, and look forward to exploring these issues with you in our discussion coming up here very, very shortly. Fact is, when somebody asks you what's up here in Southern California, the correct answer is nothing but the rent, right? <laughs> and I, I used to joke, I used to joke at real estate conferences that all real estate in California is free, actually. I don't know if you knew that. What you pay for is the weather. But it turns out to be quite profound, given what we've seen recently. Speaking of profound, Dr. Robert A. Kleinhens is with us, the economist and executive director of research for Beacon Economics, which conducts research on the regional, state, and national economies. He's a frequent contributor to media coverage on the economy, including my show, MoTeC on Money. He's also appeared on the major networks, radio, television, as well as local and international newspapers on real estate and the overall economy. Today, he's going to share with us what we can expect ahead for the South Bay region. Delighted to welcome Dr. Robert A. Kleinhens from Beacon Economics. Thank you, Frank. Profound, that's a little bit extreme. Know, it's true. Good morning, everybody. How you doing? So <clears throat> when I was a kid in the Midwest, we would, um, we would have a Christmas tree, of course, uh, because we celebrated Christmas. And uh, sometimes we'd have a live tree that we'd bring into the house in a pot, and then after Christmas, we would plant it in the ground. It's a little early to bring the pot inside the house, wouldn't you say? And, and I'm so glad that it's not yet been decorated, but maybe in another, let's, let's at least wait until Thanksgiving before we decorate the tree, okay? So it is really my pleasure to be here to talk about the California economy, the U.S. economy, and of course the South Bay Outlook. We uh, at Beacon Economics are pleased to uh, work with Cal State Dominguez Hills to produce the South Bay Forecast Report. There is a report that comes out in conjunction with this event, and uh, hopefully you'll hear about how to get your hands on that report afterwards, but it's a very deep dive on what's happening in the local economy, as well as an overview of what's happening in the national and state economy. Uh, there's so much going on. Uh, I have just a short amount of time to share my thoughts with you, uh, and so I'll try to get moving in fairly short order. There's a lot happening here. You heard about so many things happening here on campus from President Hagan. It's very exciting. Uh, this, this campus, th there's a lot going on. One of the things I thought I'd mention, uh, we're really fortunate to actually be meeting here on campus. So many events that universities hold, including economics events such as these, oftentimes are held off campus. So you never really get a chance to see what's happening, pick up the vibe uh, when you attend events. But this particular event's noteworthy in that we do get a chance to do exactly that. So that's great. You know, we've got the Rams building their complex. We've got the Chargers right next door for the time being as temporary tenants, right? LAX is going through renovation. Got the Crenshaw line extending. Uh, what else do we have going on here? Um, the ports are set most likely to have a record year for container activity, among other things. And looking a little further out on the horizon, the, uh, the whole region's gonna benefit from the 2028 Olympics. So there's so much going on uh, here in the South Bay, in Southern California as a whole. Uh, and, and Jose and Finwin, as, as you picked up from their remarks, this is really a very important and crucial region within the broader Southern California region. So to understand what's happening in your own backyard, I think is quite important. Now, before we do that, 
I would like to give you a rundown on what's happening in the U.S. and the California economy. There's so much going on. I mean, we could, we could spend an hour on each of those, but uh, don't really have the opportunity today. But after that, then we'll do a deep dive on what's happening in the South Bay. I like to frame my presentation by thinking about what you've been hearing in the headlines. Uh, so for example, the U.S. economy is now into its ninth year of economic expansion. So as expansions go, this is one of the longest on record. I'm not sure if it's the second or the third largest at this point, uh, but it certainly is closing in on the longest uh, expansion. And so a lot of people think, well, gee whiz, it, isn't there like a 10-year rule that after 10 years, everything goes bust? And the answer is no. There's no reason to think that in 10 years' time, after the economy has, has had a good run, that we're going to have a recession. There's nothing baked in the cake, as it were, that, a that an economy, you know, has its, it, its young and then it goes through its adolescent years as, you know, has zits and all that sort of stuff and then goes through middle age and then it gets to the point where it sort of conks out and dies. That's not the way the, the, the world works. It's not the way the economy works. So you'll hear more, but the recession idea is something that we need to tackle head on. No sign of recession. We've got a, a, what I would call an economy that's at cruise speed right now. And California in a housing crisis. We heard a few minutes ago about the, the situation here in the South Bay. But more generally across the state, housing has become one of the front and center policy issues of the last couple of years. And it absolutely should be because through thick and thin, we typically don't build enough housing uh, in order to accommodate population growth. There's a lot behind that. Maybe we'll get to some of the details during the Q&A. Uh, but we're really at a flashpoint right now because from our perspective, our statewide economy, in part, can't grow any faster because our labor force growth is limited in part by the high cost of housing. And then we could, of course, devote an entire conference to talking about the policies du jour from Washington, D.C. I'll spend a little bit of time talking about those, uh, but uh, don't nearly have the time to spend on them um, as maybe one would like. So the vital signs of the U.S. economy, we look at the labor market, we look at what's happening with inflation, and then overall economic activity as represented by the GDP growth rate. And, and I lead off with the labor market this time because this is as I mentioned a moment ago for the state, this is really where we're seeing that the economy is bumping into a growth constraint. The unemployment rate's just above 4%. And if you look at the right-hand side, you'll see these are year-over-year -year job changes in wage and salary jobs. The economy has slowed in the pace of job growth these last couple of years. Okay. Don't think that the next step is for us to tip into recession. That's the knee-jerk reaction. The fact is that the economy at 4% employment is at full employment. We still have people entering the labor force, and we have a lot of job openings, but what's happening is that the number of people entering the labor force and, and the skills that they have are just not matching up well with the job openings. We have a record high job of job openings in the United States right now and have had record high numbers for some time now. So, the problem is we just don't have enough people to fill the open slots. And it's not just the tech jobs that are, are wanting, but even entry-level jobs, it's hard to find people to fill those spots. So that's what you're seeing over there on the left-hand side as well as on the right-hand side. And our labor force is growing. It's just that the pace of growth has slowed. Okay, there was some concern a few years ago during the recession that there were a lot of discouraged workers who left the labor force and Maybe they weren't going to come back. Some of those workers may have had bad, not bad skills, but their skills have become obsolete, and there was no reason for them to re-enter the labor force. Well, a few years of economic expansion and some wage gains, all of those things kind of turned the tables and have brought, oh, and, okay, this is, this is labor force growth. This is labor force participation rate over on the, the right-hand side. You'll see that the labor force participation rate, the share of working age, adults um, who are part of the labor force, either they're working or they're looking for a job, that it fell systematically for several years. You look at the far right-hand side, it's just begun to edge up. So the, the, the fact is that over the next few years, we'll see this labor force participation rate somewhere in the 62 to 63% range, maybe a little bit higher than that. But it's not going to return to the 66 or 67 
that we saw several years ago because that occurred at a time when just about every boomer was still in the workforce. And as that particular age cohort leaves the workforce through retirement, it's, it has a profound effect on these kinds of metrics. And so consequently, the new normal is going to be one where the labor force participation rate over the next several years is going to be right around what you see there, right around 63%. That's OK. okay? Um, but don't think that that's a sign of something problematic with the labor market. We're not adding enough uh, people because of limits to population growth. We'll talk a minute about what's happening with immigration and the importance of immigration reform. So inflation's in check. This is a long view of inflation that you're looking at right now. Uh, the Fed would very much like to see that inflation's in the neighborhood of 2% so that it can move forward with its monetary policy efforts. Uh, but the economy and inflation hasn't been all that cooperative with, with, uh, w with the Fed and its, and its targets. Um, I put this long view just, uh, this is sort of like a history lesson because many people in the audience, uh, some people in the audience like me, will remember the late 1970s and the early 1980s when we had inflation that was double digit. Now here you're looking at the 1990s forward, and at no period of time in the last 25 years have we seen double-digit inflation. But once you experience it, it's pretty hard to shake. Okay? But in these most recent uh, couple of decades, inflation has been notably low, uh, and um, we don't have the same fears that we'll have some type of rampant double-digit inflation going forward. If you were around back then, you would come to the conclusion Geez, no inflation is good inflation. But the Fed is saying, well, we want 2% inflation. And I like to ask the question, well, why does the Fed want to see some, some inflation? And I follow up that question with another question. Um, inflation's a little bit like blood pressure. What happens if you don't have any blood pressure? Okay, so a little bit of inflation is a sign of life in the economy. It's one sign of life in the economy. And so to tolerate some, that's acceptable. To let it get out of hand is not. Okay, so the labor market in, is in good shape, but it's constrained. Inflation's in good shape. It's in check. And overall, we're seeing that the growth of the, of the U.S. economy is right in the 2% range. The most recent quarterly read that we got was that GDP grew in the second quarter by 3.1%. Um, over here on the right-hand side, you can see how each of the components of the U.S. economy contribute to GDP growth. The largest sector of the, of the U.S. economy is the consumer sector, about two-thirds of the total economy. So it's also adding roughly two-thirds uh, of, of the total growth component for, uh, for the U.S. economy at this time. The welcome sign this year is an investment. So for the last two years, we've seen investment, that is to say business spending, dragged down by one sector, energy. And that's an important sector to the local economy, as you know. So what was happening was that with the low price of oil, or more generally, the low price of energy, there was no incentive to explore and uh, to, to uh, do more drilling. And so what we saw was a big pullback in investment spending on structures and in investment spending on equipment. Almost all of that was attributable, all that pullback was attributable to what was happening in energy. Now, even though the price of oil is low, at least it has stabilized more or less around the $40 range. And so the worst of that pullback in the energy sector has mostly gone away. And so the rest of the business sector is showing up in, um, in a nice way this year, uh, such that we're seeing almost a 1% increase or contribution to growth for, uh, for the U.S. as a whole. And one other thing, you see net exports. So that's the difference between exports and imports. With the strength in the U.S. economy, we've seen our imports grow, because you and I, with growing incomes, are going to buy more stuff, including stuff that we buy from abroad. Okay. But in addition, in 2017, we've seen noteworthy growth among our trading partners. So they're buying our stuff, and so our exports have been on the rise. In fact, if you uh, look at the news items today, you'll find that the monthly trade report that comes out today shows that our trade balance actually improved because of a, a good increase in exports or relative increase in exports uh, for the month of uh, July or August. So 
the trade picture is looking good. This is also important for the South Bay because, of course, not only do we have the port of Los Angeles within the catchment basin that we're defining as the South Bay, but next door you've got the port of Long Beach. So as we look ahead, we think the consumer sector is going to continue to show steady growth, that investment spending with the energy drag over is going to continue. Some part of that, that investment spending actually has to do with residential investment, that is to say new home construction. And it's long overdue for, for growth. It's finally coming on a little bit stronger in 2017 than has been the case the last few years. So that's good. Government spending is roughly flat. Um, down on the federal side, up a little bit on the state and local side. And I already spoke about net trade. So when you look at the economy in its totality, we're looking at growth that's in the neighborhood of 2%. That's what we expect for 2017, which is a little bit faster than last year's 1.5% rate. And what we expect for 2018 is about 2% growth as well. So the magic number this year is two, about 2% 2 inflation, 2% growth, growth rate in GDP, and a little bit less than 2% growth um, in, in the labor market. Okay, How about all those things happening in Washington, D.C.? Well, you know, if you have a few days, we can talk through all of these things in some detail, but that's not what I've been given. Um, we most recently heard about the tax plan that came out on behalf of the Trump administration and the Republican leadership uh, without getting into the details, um, the one notable thing from my perspective as uh, looking at the global view is that if this is passed uh, with the details that we do have in hand, it may lead to somewhere in the neighborhood of an additional $2.5 trillion in national debt. So it's about $250 in increased budget deficit annually. Over 10 years, $2.5 trillion in increased uh, uh, national debt. Now, the problem with that is we, of course, already have a budget deficit at the federal level. And the, the administration would like to go on to this next item, which is to invest in infrastructure. You and I should want them to pursue that because um, we have an infrastructure deficit nationally that's in the trillions of dollars. And I think, you know, you drive on the roads here in Southern California and you can feel that deficit. Okay, we need to invest in our roads and other infrastructure. We saw what happened up in, uh, up in the Sacramento area during the rainy season. That's another aspect of infrastructure, uh, the dam that broke. And I'm sorry, I can't remember the name of the place, but thank you. Um, Oroville Dam, so yet another example of our infrastructure that we've relied on for so many years that previous generations financed, and it's time for us to ante up and fix that. But um, it'll be a little bit difficult if the administration gets the tax cut uh, program passed because that'll make the deficit and national debt worse. It'll make it all the more difficult to move forward on this infrastructure plan. So I'm a little bit concerned about that. Now, right out of the chute, the Trump administration uh, pulled us out of the Trans-Pacific Partnership. And we're currently talking with Mexico and Canada about revamping the, the North American Free Trade Agreement, NAFTA. Uh, as trade agreements go, NAFTA was one of the first sort of modern trade agreements, and it was a little bit more than just a trade agreement. There were a few other things in there. The TPP was truly a 21st century trade agreement. It was multilateral in nature, and it um, had there were labor protections, there were intellectual property protections, there were a whole slew of things that you wouldn't think go into a trade agreement, which in a, in a very traditional sense sort of sounds like, well, we just cut tariffs and, and trade restrictions, and then everybody goes their merry way. Um, so I can understand wanting to take a hard look at NAFTA, make sure that it's fair, make sure that we improve protections for everybody involved. But these are really important trade relationships between the US, Canada, and Mexico. We do not want to scuttle the ship. So let's hope that things uh, turn, out, uh, turn out well uh, for everybody's benefit, because these are very important trade relationships, not just for the US. But let's face it, this is, so much of this is happening in our backyard. 40% of the container activity 
in the United States comes through the Twin Ports right here in Los Angeles County. Immigration reform, also very important, not just for the U.S. as a whole, but for those of us here in California. Uh, if we're not careful, the United States is going to become somewhat like Japan. Okay? Japan uh, has a population growth rate that's just not sufficient to be able to fuel its economy with bodies, with its workforce. And yet it is hesitant to admit foreign workers to, to fill that void. We have historically been uh, a lot more inclined to, to do just that, to allow people to come in from other countries and to, um, to fill the void that is filled, I mean, that is, that is made by uh, not having enough workers that we produce here in the United States, that we, we grow here. Um, well, this is a big problem these days because birth rates in the United States have been falling. And uh, so consequently, if we don't get the immigration reform right, we're not only going to make it difficult for those companies, those tech companies to get those skilled workers, but I'm sure you already know that it's difficult in the construction sector, it's difficult in agriculture. You know, this is just part and parcel of the fabric of the local economy, to have a workforce that is partially homegrown and that is augmented by international workers. So we got to get that right. Uh, Obamacare um, or repeals to Obamacare are sort of like zombies. They just keep resurfacing. I don't know what to say about that. Um, <laughs> I think the bottom line here is that it's really hard to get change to happen because even though the Republicans have the, um, the White House as well as the leadership posts in both the House of Representatives and in the Senate, there are just a lot of factions. And so um, in a way, it's sort of like saying that or observing that um, there's not a lot different in 2017 compared to, say, 14, 15, 16 when you had so many different factions, whether they were Democratic or Republican, that just could not form a coalition to get things done. And that's not really what we elected people to, to go to Washington, D.C. for. On the monetary policy front, uh, very quickly, I already talked a little about, a bit about the Fed's desire to uh, see inflation hit 2 percent. And um, what, it needs, what it wants to do is move forward with two policy goals. One. Uh, to raise the Fed funds rate, which is the short-term rate, and two, uh, to liquidate its balance sheet, which it ran up during the Great Recession. And so, long story short, um, the, the problem is that the Fed doesn't have the kind of, of, of influence that it had, say, 10 and certainly 25 or 30 years ago. This financial market's a global market. You've got global investors who are buying into securities and so on. And so that global market is keeping market rates low. It's keeping long rates low. So if the Fed tries to push up the short-term rate, which is the Fed funds rate, at a time when the market is keeping long-term rates low or in check, uh, it's going to run into some, some policy problems. Uh, and so we just have to monitor things. One of the, th the things that I am concerned about is that the Fed does perhaps take an action that is out of line with what's happening with the market. I actually want to give the, the Fed, the current Fed leadership credit for, for not tripping over its, its feet uh, and doing stuff like that. But past Feds, even with bright people, have, have made policy mistakes. They tend to be reactive, not proactive, because they are a policy institution. And sometimes their policies being uh, lagged in response to what's happening can cause problems in the U.S. economy. So we just have to be watchful to make sure that things are in the clear. Of course, the, um, the financial markets, we've got low rates over on the right-hand side, still historically low rates on the right-hand side. So with low rates, that's low rates of return uh, for investors. There really are not a lot of places to go. So you see that we continue to rack up record highs on the um, financial, I mean, on the equities markets, okay? Uh, so this is our outlook for this year and next, about 2% growth. Domestic spending really is the flywheel that maintains momentum in the U.S. economy. Not a lot happening with oil prices, uh, but we are a little bit concerned down there at the bottom uh, with what's happening in the equities markets, okay? And it's, you know, there's not a lot of other alternatives for investors to turn to, so um, we'll have to see how that plays out. California. So... Boy, oh boy, we, we get beaten up, we beat, uh, we beat ourselves up over the business climate and so on. 
Uh, and so many people say the business climate's not good, cost of living is high here, the regulatory burden is high. Um, this is just not a good place to, to conduct business. Well, let's look at these numbers really quickly. Our unemployment rates come down quickly over these last few years. It's very close to the U.S. rate, but because of the mix of our economy's jobs, or I should say industries, versus the nation as a whole, we tend to have a little bit higher unemployment rate through thick and thin. Our job growth has slowed, but for three years running, we clearly outpaced the U.S. in terms of job gains, closer to 3% for us versus about 2% for the uh, U.S. as a whole. And compared to other states, we're among the top states in terms of job gains, in terms of economic activity, a whole slew of metrics, okay? So maybe we are a high cost state, maybe there are a lot of environmental re regulations and so on, but somehow businesses manage to um, you know, harness their forces and still do well. And let's keep in mind that this place is still, uh, con uh, continues to be known as uh, an entrepreneurial hotbed. Uh, about half of the venture capital that comes into the United States goes to California. Large share goes to the Silicon Valley, but a substantial share comes here to Southern California. So let's not forget that California has an economy that's doing well, has consistently outperformed many other states around the nation, um, and uh, we expect that to continue. I can't spend a whole lot of time on California because I really want to talk about, about um, the South Bay, but you'll see in my bullets here that housing, once again, is, is an item that I mentioned. We'll talk a little bit more about that in just a minute. Turning to LA County and the South Bay, uh, it's, it's time to finally say this. I talked about the labor market being a constraint on growth. So what's happened over the past year, so past year, so we'll talk about, say, September of 2017 and a year ago, September of 2016, the pace of job growth in 16 was considerably higher than it was most recently in 2017. Here we've got August, August numbers, and Los Angeles County, the yellow bar, grew by a little bit less than 1%, adding jobs at a little bit less than 1% year over year. A year ago, it was about double that. Um, so the, the real catch in LA County and the local economy is very much like that of the nation. We're constrained by growth in labor supply. Um, throughout the state, these, pay, these rates of job growth are uh, somewhat slower than we had seen a year ago and much slower than a couple years ago. Still, LA County continues to lead the pack in terms of job gains overall, absolute job gains, but that makes sense because we account for uh, around 20 plus percent of all jobs in the state of California. Okay? And locally, uh, this is good news. We saw that in 2000. Uh, 17, we added jobs at a slightly faster clip than we did the year before uh, at 1.4%. And looking ahead to next year, we expect to stay fairly on fairly the same trajectory, about a 1.2% gain, about 500, I'm sorry, 570,000 jobs in the local job base, which includes the incorporated cities of the South Bay, sort of starting um, right around LAX, going around sort of following the 405 freeway down through San Pedro and including uh, some of the communities that are a part of incorporated city of Los Angeles, just so you see the, uh, how this all adds up, okay? And the unemployment rates in uh, the South Bay region largely are lower than that of the county as a whole. Um, for those of you who are real geeks, you'll know that LA County uh, reports both a seasonally adjusted and a not seasonally adjusted rate uh, the, these are not seasonally adjusted because we um, can't get the seasonally adjusted rates for the individual cities, okay? And if, if that sounded like gobbledygook to the rest of you, that's fine. You can just ignore that statement. But so, so the unemployment rates across most of the communities here in the South Bay are well below that of L.A. County and also well below that of the state. So this is good news for, for the local economies and the local, local labor markets, okay? And when we take a look at where job changes have been happening, uh, if you were to look at this compared to a year ago, uh, you'll find that this year we don't have nearly as many sectors of the economy adding jobs on a consistent basis. It's a little bit of a break from what we've seen the last few years. By and large, we've got the, uh, 
The same industries that are adding jobs here in the South Bay and, and Los Angeles County, it's construction, it's healthcare, um, also leisure and hospitality. Uh, but we're seeing some other sectors that are under pressure, retail trade, you'll hear more about that. This is a little bit of a mixed bag. Um, you'll, you'll hear about this, um, this tension, we'll say, between bricks and mortar and online activity. Uh, the retailer that can figure out both of those retail channels is going to succeed big time, and, and, but some uh, are going to have a, a, a greater challenge. Well, right now we're seeing that retail trade employment, which is down there about two-thirds of the way down, is about flat for the year as a whole, down slightly for the month of, for the month of August. Okay. We'll see it pick up a little bit in um, the latter part of this year because of the seasonality with the holiday season. Okay, retail trade, I'll just, since we just got done talking about it, it's about a third of the way down here in the, in the South Bay list, and it's also down slightly, down nine-tenths of 1%. But what you see is uh, for the South Bay construction activity, um, uh, natural resources, and here we're talking about uh, the, the energy business and manufacturing, um, are all up nicely uh, in year-over-year -year terms. Uh, this is a set of numbers through 2016, which is the most recent data for which we can, we can report on the, um, on the South Bay region. Transportation utilities is also up 5.7%. Uh, so these are really strong gains in very important, important uh, key sectors of the local economy. Tourism is also important. You see down at the bottom, leisure and hospitality is up 5%. I talked a little bit about trade earlier. This shows the container activity of the two ports, Los Angeles and Long Beach. And um, the record high was back before the recession, back in 2006 and 2007. If things go as they have this year, we won't just hit 15.8 million containers, which is what we had back in 2006, uh, but more like 16.5 million containers. It'll be a clear record-breaking year. And that's because of what I described earlier when talking about the trade picture. We finally have both a strong domestic economy, which is giving rise to inbound contain, height, in, heightened inbound container activity, and strong economies among our trading partners, so our exports are also doing quite well. Turning for the moment to how much people are making. Uh, here in the South Bay, we tend to see that wages, the average wage across industries is a little bit higher than that for, for the county as a whole. And also the pace of increase is slightly faster, 2.6% compared to just under 2% for all workers in Los Angeles County. Um, and here are the industries and the corresponding average pay rate. So information uh, is a little bit of a misnomer because nobody really knows what information is. Uh, it includes people in the newspaper business. Okay, I get that. Okay. But also includes people in, in information technology. And so a 122,000, I'm not sure that there are very many people in the newspaper industry that are making $122,000. That number is really being led by what's happening in the tech sector in the local area. Okay. Manufacturing, a little over $100,000. That's largely uh, due to the aerospace sector, which typically has um, average pay that's in the six-figure range or a little bit shy of that. Financial activities, wholesale trade, wholesale trade and transportation utilities are tied together in the transportation logistics sector. All of these are better than the, um, the all industries average for the South Bay as well as for uh, Los Angeles County as a whole. Not everybody uh, gets a, commands a six-figure salary. I'm sure we all know that. Uh, but as you might suspect, leisure and hospitality and retail trade have an average wage that's, that are the lowest. Now, let's just be clear about this. This is simply taking the total wage, wages earned and dividing it by the number of people. So this is not a full-time equivalent wage. Okay? And so you've got a, a larger concentration of part-time workers in leisure and hospitality and in retail than perhaps some of these other sectors. And so if, uh, that, coupled with the fact that there are a lot of entry-level people who are working in these sectors, will contribute to uh, these outcomes where the wages for these sectors are somewhat lower. Okay? Um, taxable sales is an important indicator of the overall health of the local economy because it's a reflection of the spending power 
that is exerted on the part of its residents and its businesses. And we've seen some nice gains. The, the line shows percentage changes in year-over-year -year terms. And what we like to see is increases in the 3 to 5% range. And that's exactly what we've seen over the last couple of years and expect to see continuing going forward. On the housing front, uh, you've heard some really good observations about the uh, housing market in the South Bay, about affordability, about commuting. Uh, Rest assured, South Bay residents are not by themselves. They're not alone in having um, problems with affordability. Uh, Los Angeles County's median price is a little bit over $575,000. It's been increasing just as the uh, median prices around the, around the region have been on the rise. Um, it's still shy of its record high. The record high was about $625,000 uh, back before the recession. Uh, so there's some room for it to increase, uh, but let's just keep in mind that um, incomes have not increased by the same pace. So the affordability problem is a front and center problem for home ownership as well as for renters. Okay? Um, here are some signs of stress in the housing market. Okay? Home ownership rates are at their lowest rates in decades. Uh, we have escalating rents in the company rent burden among the highest uh, here in the Southern California of any place uh, around the country. And we're just not building enough. I mean, that's the big issue. All the way at the bottom, you can see it's really about supply. So anything that makes it possible for buyers to afford uh, favorable down payment programs and things like that, that's all well and good, but it doesn't really address the heart of the issue, which is we just need to increase the supply of homes at this time to accommodate population growth that's been occurring for many years. Um, on the non-residential side, very quickly, industrial vacancy rates uh, and overall the industrial uh, uh, property market has been going strong. We've got under 1% vacancy rates and rents on the rise. Office is a little bit different. Uh, vacancy rates tend to be in the double digits across the region as well as across LA County, but they're coming down. Um, so. You know, there's a lot of room for improvement on the um, non-residential side, at least with respect to um, office uh, space. Uh, but this area, southern of uh, uh, the South Bay, I should say, is one of the tightest markets for, for office space at the present time. So let me wrap up by just making the following observations. We'll, we see not a recession, but continued growth in the local economy. Population growth will edge up. I mean, this area is built out, so you're not going to see huge population gains. Um, taxable sales will continue to rise, so that's a sign of the overall well-being of the local economy. And affordability concerns will continue. When you look a little bit further, let's look out 5 and 10 and 15 years, we have to ask, well, where is the growth in the region going to come from? There are two, we like to break industries into these two groups, local serving and export oriented. Those at the bottom increase the size of the economic pie, and those at the top are how the, 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 the funds that are generated recirculate in the local economy. When we take a look at LA County's key industries, the ones that are export-oriented, many of them have a significant presence here in the South Bay. You've got business services. You've got uh, hospitality, tourism, transportation, logistics, petroleum, aerospace manufacturing. So, so many of these industries that are key to a growing LA County have a home right here in the South Bay. So if we can get it right for LA County and for the South Bay, uh, it'll make everybody better off, okay? And, and just closing out, this is our, a, a way of seeing how important these industries are to the local area. Natural resources, we're talking energy, um, has a relative concentration of three to one. That is to say, we have three times more workers, relatively speaking, in this sector of the economy here in the South Bay compared to LA County as a whole. Okay, so a higher concentration in natural resources, in transportation should be no surprise, and in manufacturing. Okay, so if, if we grow the South Bay and these key industries, the whole region will benefit as a result. So on that note, I think I'm going to stop and say thank you and wish you a good morning. Please stay with us, Dr. Kleinhens. Let's bring up the self-described nerds and geeks for a 
discussion now on Smoot-Hawley tariffs that led up to the Great <laughs> Depression. No, we're not going to do that like Ben Stein did in Ferris Bueller's Day Off, but we are going to continue the conversation on real estate and the other relevant issues here in the South Bay. But first of all, Dr. Kleinhans, or maybe one of the other economists would like to field this question. We keep hearing that the inflation rate is non-existent practically, and we've heard this for years, and yet people can barely afford the houses that they're in. How is the inflation rate calculated, and especially as it relates to housing, you know, how, do we, um, how do we understand the inflation rate nowadays? Well, I'll take a crack at that for starters. Um, when you look at how much money we spend uh, across all the things that you and I buy, we buy, you know, the big things are housing expenses and transportation expenses. Those two things each maybe take up about 15 to 18 percent of the typical housing budget each. Um, but we spend our money on a lot of services that don't register inflation a whole lot. And then we also buy goods that, um, that where, where the prices just haven't gone up by as much. So, uh, yeah, housing by itself can go up by a lot, but it's just one part of our overall set of consumer purchases or expenditures. And so, consequently, the overall rate of inflation might be at 2 percent, even though our housing expenses are going up by 8 or 9 percent. Obviously, we are in a boom and bust state. And, and for Dr. Martinez or, or Dr. Prager, based on what Dr. Kleinan just said, the fact that we've seen this tremendous run-up over the last 10 years, where do you think we are in the cycle at the moment? I think trying to predict uh, where is the next recession, if that's what you're alluding to, is definitely difficult. And, uh, but we don't see any major worrying signs at the moment. I think it looks like uh, Robert was mentioning at the, at the nation uh, perspective and also the local economy, uh, all the signs are for the most part positive, so we don't expect a downturn um, or a significant downturn in the near future for that same reason. And we're reminded, of course, that home ownership rates are pretty much at historic lows. So what about on the rent side? Any sign of rents leveling out in this area? I think you can. Yeah, I mean, th there's some indications that that may be happening. Um, one interesting factor is that with the decrease in Chinese investment that is anticipated in this region, in, in real estate in particular, um, that might soften the bubble increase a little bit. Um, the capital controls that have been put in place in China may, may have some influence there. Let's talk about that. Uh, what's currently in place? Uh, the Chinese government recently uh, this year constrained a foreign investment by their citizens and it seems to be having an impact here uh, on real estate here in Southern California, or is it? Give us an update on what's happening. I think one of the, re the interesting things is that that investment is largely in real estate. Mm -hmm. So um, I just found some figures that around 29% of all foreign real estate investment comes from China. Mm -hmm. um, and these are especially in what are called mega deals, so you know, a billion dollar plus deals. Um, but they're still having an impact on some, um, you know, hotel office and also housing markets. Yeah, can I just add? Um, so uh, there was a fair discussion on the, uh, the presence of foreign-owned establishments. And um, I think it's worth taking a look back at history in the 70s and 80s. Uh, well, even go back even a couple more decades than that. Then you, at that time, you saw Japan's companies begin to establish a foothold here in the United States. Uh, by the 70s and 80s, they had uh, surpluses such that they were buying downtown Los Angeles. Many of you will remember that you know many of the commercial buildings in downtown LA were owned by mm -hmm. landlords from, from Japan. Uh, and the tide has changed, of course, um, since then. But uh, with respect to China, which everybody is, is looking at uh, as a potential foreign investor, I See, it shouldn't be a surprise that they're investing right now in, in real estate, um, and it remains to be seen whether or not their presence in terms of bringing their establishments here to the United States, how successful they're going to be on that front. And the Chinese certainly seem to be interested in trophy properties such as yeah. the Waldorf in New York, and we have, uh, of course, uh, properties locally. Um, one Beverly Hills, I believe, the, pro the Wanda property there next to the new Waldorf Astoria in, in Beverly Hills. Why aren't we seeing more uh, foreign-owned um, enterprises uh, from China, given that it is such a major trading partner here in the South Bay? Uh, let me just start, because sure. 
you know, LA is cheap by international standards. Mm -hmm. So I'll leave it at that. <laughs> For the Chinese. Okay, yeah. go ahead. And so just to build on that, interestingly, of all the Chinese investment, only 7% comes into LA. I think the biggest market for Chinese um, real estate investment is New York, where around 40% of all money coming to the US um, goes to New York, which I think is a real opportunity, right, for this region to really market itself to that investment potential. I think there's, there's huge potential there. Gentlemen, we have some wild cards, of course. The great, so-called great unwind is just beginning with the Federal Reserve winding down its balance sheet. It's concerned about rising interest rates. What is the outlook on interest rates and how it might impact real estate here? Um, as Robert mentioned, I hope that uh, the Federal Reserve does it in a pretty paceful um, manner that it doesn't create any uncertainty in the market. If it does it that way, I think it's not going to be a major impact in the markets unless they decide to do something drastic or not to follow what the reading signs are. And also another issue is what I mentioned, there's a lag always in policy. Hopefully by the time they do something, the economy hasn't changed that much because if the economy is going down and they keep doing something like this, then it, it could make things worse. Thank you, gentlemen. We're going to continue the program and try to stay on track in our schedule here. Thank you very much. Please join me in thanking our esteemed panel of economists. And now I'm going to introduce this morning's speakers. Each speaker will give an eight-minute presentation. We're very precise here. And then we'll convene on the stage for a panel discussion. Our first presentation will be from Dr. Christine Cooper. In her role as economist, Dr. Christine Cooper has conducted comprehensive research on regional issues such as economic impact studies, regional economic base analyses, industry employment forecasts, demographic overviews, workforce development, and occupational forecast and policy analysis. Today, she's going to set the stage for a conversation on trends and changes in consumer behavior. Delighted to welcome Dr. Christine Cooper. Wow, good morning. Are we ready to talk about the consumer? Two-thirds of the economy, right, as Robert said, uh, generating about two-thirds of economic growth in the region. We ought to be really worried about what's happening with these people. That's the you and me. So let's just take a, uh, uh, just a quick look back. Remember merchandising way back when? Do you remember Henry Ford's famous saying, you can have it in any color you want as long as it's black? <laughs> one choice. We are not settling for one choice anymore. We want infinite choice. So the other thing that we remember and what we've been doing is really packing shopping centers. So fighting for parking spaces, uh, return lines, waiting in return lines. We're dragging our stuff home. We're not really happy about that anymore. So today's consumer is not settling for that anymore. Right? We want a different experience. And we expect a different experience. So we have four different, really main desires. We want the, the experience really to be easy, right? From start to finish. From shopping, from looking, searching, buying, trying it on, bringing it back. We want it all to be easy. We want it all to be done start to finish without any problem. Well, that's pretty simple these days, right? It's at our fingertips. You just press it, press the button. You're looking throughout the world for what you want and you can have it done for you. In fact, just press the button. You actually don't even he need to carry cash with you. You don't need to schlep your bags home. You just um, press the button, and it's all done for you. So when we look at the data about retail, this is the percentage of retail sales that are done online. Back in 2000, it was about 1% of all retail sales were done online. Now it's over 11%. And if you look at those bars, they're actually increasing at a higher rate now. So this is not a trend that's going to stop. Wow, home delivery. We don't even go have to go to the store. We don't even have to deal with a UPS driver anymore, right? Uh, so this has a huge implication for land use, though, right? There's the stores and, the, and where the stuff is coming from. We need the stuff to be located close to us because it has to be delivered today. I'm not, I'm not willing to wait for it tomorrow. It's got to come today, especially if it's hot pizza. <laughs> so
So this is, uh, this is just showing two different types of space. The, the red line is showing growth in retail space per capita um, and how that's occurred since uh, 2000. And the blue line is warehousing space. So you can see after the recession, the retail space per person in the United States has, has remained flat. But warehousing space continues to grow. OK, well, we got one other thing we have to add to this kind of picture. Even ordering, looking, finding, buying has become too much of a problem for us. We're just lazy. So now we're doing this thing called subscription services. Wow, I just like put in some of my preferences, and somebody will fill the box for me and deliver it to me. I don't even have to wait. I don't have to go. I don't have to turn on my computer. It comes automatically once a week, once a month. And who doesn't like to open a box? I mean, this is the appeal of getting something. It's like Christmas, right? This is what we want. We want to be happy. Uh, and it's fabulous because if we enter our own kind of style, the box is full of stuff that we like, right? Which is the other pre uh, second preference. Make it for me. I don't want a black Model T Ford. I want a pink one. Maybe. Maybe I want a pink one. Maybe I don't want a Model T. I want to have it made specially for me, my style, my taste, fit my community, fit my house. I don't want to buy a wedding dress that my girlfriends wore. I want somebody to make something special for me. For me. But even that's not good enough because we don't really want to take too much time consuming stuff to, to fill up our homes with stuff. We actually just want the experience, right? So we'd rather have the ride, but we don't want to own the car. We want a vacation, but not the timeshare. I'm not buying a mountain cabin. I don't need to. We want to read a book or watch a movie, but we're going to do it digitally. I don't want a, a bookshelf full of books. I don't want all these CDs on my shelf. And maybe we want to try some non-traditional medicine as well. It's a different experience. It comes with a different experience. And actually, what we're seeing, uh, in a, sorry, in a nod to our panelists here, <laughs> we'd like the whole box to be uh, given. We want to cook a dinner, but I don't want a pantry full of condiments, which I'm never ever going to use again, or a bunch of staples, or goodness, please, not the cookbooks. Give me the box. I'll put it together. My husband will be happy, and we'll feel great. <laughs> Similarly, I want that box of clothes. I want to feel great and beautiful. Um, and yes, damn it, we all do want to look like Heather Locklear. <laughs> I'm just saying. <laughs> Even now when we go shopping, we just don't want one of those malls. We want to go to a place that's a community center where we can enjoy, where we can have food and entertainment, where people can gather, where, where you might linger a while with your friends. We might want to hear a concert or a lecture in an outdoor space. So even the nature of our shopping centers are changing. Um, and even old malls now are being redeveloped to add residential units, which is good for the housing shortage. But it also creates a really urban center. So lastly, I, as a consumer, I'm pretty informed. We know about everything right now. We're connected to the world. We're connected to our community. We read all the reviews online. We know what, what works and what doesn't. We don't really need to be marketed to as much as anybody else because we already have it. We have this information at our fingertips. So this is really a changing consumer world. And I want to know if we're ready for it. Thank you very much, Dr. Cooper. In fact, let's bring to the stage now our next speaker, Giancarlo Filartiga, representing Mesa Rich Real Estate, big commercial real estate firm. Today, Giancarlo Filartiga will provide some insight on retail trends, both fashion and experiential. And we'll also hear about the exciting multi-use Carson land development project, which will include retail outlet stores. Please join me in welcoming Giancarlo Filartiga. Sono molto lieto di fare la sua conoscenza. Very well said, Giancarlo Filartiga. 
<clears throat> my name is Giancarlo Filartiga, and I'm here to talk about uh, retail trends, and in particular, um, brick and mortar retail trends. I work for a company named Macerich. <clears throat> we are based in Santa Monica, and uh, we specialize in uh, developing uh, shopping centers in high barrier to entry markets. Those sites are very difficult, very um, hard to find, uh, and therefore our projects are in large met metropolitan areas like New York, Washington DC, Chicago, San Francisco, and Los Angeles. Um, I have been in the development industry for about 27 years now, and I had um, projects in California before, uh, but I finally moved to California last year. Um, so I'm an uptick to uh, population growth. Um, I'm also uh, experiencing um, the commute times and the, and, and the housing prices, so I can attest to that. Um, I, when I moved here, I bought a new car, and um, my car tells me when it got to 1,000 miles, it said, average speed, 16 miles per hour. <laughs> um, and I was expecting, you know, to drive down the Pacific Coast Highway with, you know, driving at 60 miles per hour. That hasn't happened yet. <clears throat> so... Um, Shopping, purchasing is about money um, in, in many ways and transferring money uh, in no matter what form uh, that takes place. Uh, there are two, two, two particular models or two principal models uh, for shopping, the brick and mortar and online. Uh, brick and mortar, of course, are physical stores, face-to-face -face interaction with, cost with customers. Online shopping, uh, everybody knows, is consumers uh, purchasing goods and services from the seller in real time. Of course, uh, to do that, <clears throat> you need an internet connection. And if you don't have an internet connection, you may, <clears throat> you may have to come to one of our brick and mortar stores. Some of the presenters alluded to this, and um, this is e-commerce, uh, 2016 figures. Uh, represented 8.2% of all retail sales in the U.S. The trend for this year is 9.2% in 2017, uh, growing at 16% a year. Uh, the online sales have had a tremendous growth uh, and is forecasted to keep growing, but as you can see, um, the, the forecast is for the growing to slow down over the next few years. And many believe that that 9.2% will become, will stabilize at about 20%. So uh, we would like to think that the good feel story is that about 20% uh, in the future of all retail sales will be online and about 80% will be still on in brick and mortar stores. Um, the US is at 9.2 or forecasted at 9.2 this year. Um, there are other countries, of course, like the UK, I think they're at 16%, uh, China, South Korea, Germany, Denmark, Norway, they, they have much higher percentages than, than the US. Um, the fastest growing sector of online is mobile. Um, it's not, you don't need a computer anymore. Uh, you, can, you can purchase and browse and uh, acquire things uh, from your phone or from your tablet. Brick and mortar. Um, brick and mortar are, is composed, of course, of stores, uh, different types of stores, department stores, luxury stores, outlet stores, supermarket, food, uh, warehouses, mom and pop, uh, and those are located typically in uh, centers that, depending on their tenant mix and depending on the size and location, they are classified as neighborhood centers, community centers, trip centers, power centers, um, and so on. These are figures from 2016 by the uh, International Council of Shopping Centers. There are 116,000 shopping centers in the U.S. Um, out of those, only 595 are regional malls. Uh, the majority of the 
uh, of the retail centers or the shopping centers are strip centers or neighborhood centers. Um, 607 are super regional malls, 500 lifestyle, 376 in the whole country are outlets. Of course, uh, out of all of those, some of them are very good outlets or very good malls. Some of them are not so good. Uh, and the industry keeps uh, changing and some of those that are C and D uh, level malls are being redeveloped or disappearing. Um, shopping center sales, we were looking at online shopping <clears throat> representing about 9% of uh, all retail sales. Shopping center sales are still $2.64 trillion and direct employment is 12.9. I think 12.9 uh, million people of direct employment is approximately 10% of all the working population of the US. So everybody has been hearing about the retail ap apocalypse, right? Um, and it makes great headlines. Uh, and it's true. Uh, in, in many ways, um, there is a constant evolution of retail. And some, um, some retailers have been challenged um, by uh, technology, uh, others by new business models. Uh, but the story is that this year, for instance, there will be 4,000 new openings. And you can see on the top left, there are 14,000 openings, 10,000 closures, a net uh, gain of 4,000 stores. Now, there are different types of stores in different categories. What we hear all the time is that the department stores are closing, and it's true. J.C. Penney, Macy's, Sears, mm -hmm. we all heard um, that they're closing between 380 and 400 stores this year. Specialty soft goods, especially um, fashion, um, a lot of stores are closing. Uh, the Gap uh, and other names that we heard, Wet Seal. Um, and that can be attributed uh, in some ways, perhaps, to the emergence of other retailers like fast fashion. But I think that, uh, if you look at this, this chart, it tells you, um, yes, some type of retail is, is changing. There's consolidation. Some, some stores may disappear. I remember. Um, Back in the 50s, I think there were uh, at least two dozen types uh, or names of department stores. Uh, nowadays, there are like, I think, seven or eight. Uh, so it has been an evolution over the last few years that department stores, that business model, um, has been decaying. And specialty stores that sell uh, gowns or that sell particular products have been chipping away at department stores. Uh, also cosmetics, now uh, we have a specialized uh, cosmetic stores like Ulta uh, and others, Sephora, that uh, have taken that away from the department stores. Um, so what we're hearing is that traffic is declining, uh, this is for, for shopping malls, that traffic is declining, uh, that the malls are dying, uh, that uh, department stores are going away, and, and we don't, that's not our view. Um, my company in particular, Maserich, we focus on A-level and B-level properties. Um, the truth is that 20% 20 20 of all the malls in the country are uh, A-level malls, and they account for 72% of mall sales. Um, uh, we believe that the good properties are going to continue to get, to get better, and uh, the C and D malls uh, will probably disappear or be redeveloped into something else. Um, so what are the trends? Um, there, there, are, there are trends uh, just in general. Uh, as you can imagine in any industry, there are many trends going at the same time. Some trends uh, are contradictory to other trends. Uh, but what we're seeing for sure is that stores are getting smaller. Uh, there is a less emphasis on cars, so less parking, more ride share, more Uber, more Lyft. Uh, the emergence of pop-up stores and um, more experiential retail. I think I, that was just mentioned now. Um, better malls are evolving and uh, channels continue to converge uh, from uh, online, uh, catalog, telephone, uh, the omni retail that we, that we call. Uh, so I'm just gonna talk about two trends. Pop-up stores are uh, short-term retailers, 
uh, that lease a space in a mall uh, for by month or or very short periods of time, and that gives the opportunity to perhaps uh, local designers to test their products. What we're seeing is that a lot of companies that are very successful online want to see if they can transfer that into bricks and mortar, and they're uh, starting to have pop-up stores. Also, there are uh, many stores, many company stores that may not have a presence in a particular market will do a pop-up store for uh, uh, a period of time, for instance, Christmas. So here, for instance, uh, we see the, the, um, the trailer, the street, the, the, I took that picture in Santa Barbara a couple of weeks ago. We have one of Tesla uh, on the right. Uh, and big name uh, retailers like Louis Vuitton, Tiffany's, Hermes, and BMW, all with their own version of pop-up stores. Uh, another trend is entertainment, um, and that being gyms, uh, golf, uh, skydiving, bowling, escape rooms, laser tag, uh, cinemas with dining. Um, so uh, uh, the tenant mix is changing, uh, and um, we are adding this type of concepts to malls. Um, top right, of course, is uh, sky skydiving, lower left is uh, uh, cart indoor racing uh, that was part of a project I developed in Europe. Uh, top golf on the right, um, which is an experience. It's a social experience. It's a great. I don't know if you ever been. Uh, it's fantastic. Lower left is a snow dome also developed uh, that I developed in Spain. Um, key figures. Uh, just wanted to. This is simply to point out the impact of. Uh, bricks and mortar, there's about $5 billion of construction activity per month in the US um, in bricks and mortar uh, shopping centers. And that has an economic impact of $109 billion. Uh, in California, um, we see that um, there is, uh, that we pay, shopping centers pay uh, a large um, amount of uh, sales tax uh, and contributes to, to the communities in such way, 26.8 billion in 2006, and in property taxes, 3.2 billion. Um, so I think those are very significant numbers. Um, let's see what else. Fashion outlets, Los Angeles. So this is just a quick uh, introduction to our project. Uh, we have a project right here in Carson. Um, brand new project uh, on the former landfill that we're partnering uh, with the city of Carson in. Uh, it's going to be a $410 million project, uh, only retail um, with some food, uh, located uh, on the 405 at the Lamo Boulevard, across from the Porsche Experience. Uh, on 40 acres, 562,000 square feet uh, on one level, open air. Uh, this is the view from the 405. Uh, this is uh, the view from the interior. Uh, and this is what we call the runway, uh, where we have a stage and, uh, and food offerings. And uh, this is one of the entries from the parking below up to the shopping level. And that's it. Thank you very much, and congratulations on that great project there. And next presenter is Sean Gold with Textile Fashion Group. Textile is an industry-leading platform that was created to build global membership-driven fashion brands. It's supported by a community of more than 4.5 million active members. Sean will now talk about changes in the fashion landscape, growth of e-commerce in that industry, and the future of fashion retail. Please welcome Sean Gold to the stage to hear more about the retail experience. President Hagen, for having me. Uh, I was getting dressed this morning. My wife was said, where are you going? I said, I'm going to the South Bay Economic Forecast Conference. And, what goes on there, she said, and I said, it was like the 
Davos of Dominguez Hills. <laughs> she said, don't forget to drink your smoothie. She's very difficult to impress, this woman. Um, so Textile has grown, it's a, it's a South-based startup uh, in the fashion space that's grown from zero to 700 million in seven years, employing about 550 people in the South Bay. Um, I'm gonna tell you how we're bucking the trend and a little bit about the company. This young lady's perfume is very distracting. Um, the, so our, our, <laughs> our mission is to reimagine the fashion business by creating the world's most innovative and admired fashion company here in the South Bay. Um, there's a lot of changes that have happened in retail over the years from the railroads to the catalog. Um, to uh, internet hitting the home, but the most really, I think the big, the things that we're dealing with right now that are really changing that we're adjusting our business for are certainly e-commerce, social media, the impact that's having on commerce, and obviously the mobile phone. Um, we're seeing uh, a lot of retailers are reporting that online is growing 8%, but there's a bit of a leaky bucket where uh, their traditional retail is growing, the brick and mortar is dropping. And um, that's creating a little bit of a chaos. Um, as the former speaker said, it's not, it's, it, some markets are, it, it's really just shifting things around. And what companies like us have to do is really just adjust to where the opportunity is. So it used to be that you want to see it first, you want to try it on, you want it now. Uh, the new normal is easy returns, fast shipping, a better user experience, pricing transparency. As a retailer now, we need to have exclusive product or you might as well just buy it on Amazon because they're amazing at getting the product to you. And now even further, we're taking things into personalization and individualized product experience and size filtering. And it's getting more, more and more in the e-commerce space, things are really about addressing an individual consumer's needs. So this year for fashion, about 18% of sales are online. By, it's generally predicted uh, for Kantar that by 2021 it'll be 30%. But we think it's going to be closer to 50%. And the reason is two years ago, 24, we have about 4.6 million members. We polled them and uh, a good portion of them said they shop online, offline. Most of them preferred shopping online to I mean, sorry, probably preferred shopping brick and mortar to offline. I mean, to online, sorry. And then within 24 months, we're seeing a rapid change in this, that really everything, people are just, once they go online, they experience the convenience and they experience the personalization, we see that our customers are shopping with us more and more and more. Um, the advantages of online commerce is that, or, or the opportunity now for companies like us are building brands online first. Um, we see what's working, it's much easier. We're vertical integration company or companies like ours are organized much differently than companies have been in the past. And agile, agri, ag, agile acquisition, acquiring customers is a new core competency that is very different than it used to be. So as far as building, the a brand's online first, we get immediate feedback. We can see um, what customers like, what they don't like. We adjust our product line and um, constantly iterate on product. Uh, instant national avail uh, availability. We sell in 10 countries, but and obviously we sell all over the US and we can go to any market. And then data-driven individualized personalization. We you know, we have 4.6 million customers and we probably have about you know, maybe 6,000 different emails that go out to these customers, different catalogs that go out to them. The, the experience on the site is different for every customer that comes. So the, the metrics of the past have generally been store openings and same store comps. Today's metrics are customer acquisition, how much it costs to get a customer, and lifetime value of the customer. Because we know lifetime value of the customer, we can lose $30 on the, customer, on the first customer coming in where you can't really lose money at the retail customer on the first, you know, uh, at your first relationship, at the first experience. You have to constantly make money where we sort of hedge, we acquire the customer and hedge that relationship 
for a long-term purchase cycle. Vertical integration. The organization of the company is, as I said, really different than it used to be. Um, where's the gap? They would never think about outsourcing real estate because that's their core competency. We look at technology the same way. We develop all of our in technology in-house. We do all of our media buying in-house. We even do all of our creative in-house. We have a pretty extensive data science team, which really retailers didn't have as much in the past. Um, last year, this year, we'll spend about $150 million in media, and we'll we'll have about 150 different iterations of our TV commercials. That's about 40 different TV spots that we made for six different countries that we're also constantly optimizing and testing. Well, we ran 24,000 Facebook ads last year. So when we start a campaign over about a two-week period, we will each month we launch a different collection. So at the beginning of the month, we'll have about anywhere from 2,500 to 4,000 Facebook ads that we will test and within two weeks, we'll nail it down to about four or five that are really working. It's a pretty amazing process. Um, and now we're getting into retail. So we're an e-commerce company, and we're moving into the retail space because 50% of retail, we think, will be happening at brick and mortar. So we have to address that audience. And the audience, and in truth, people don't only want to shop online. But we're taking a different approach to it. Um, we're building our customer base online first. And then we're building the retail, the brick and mortar to service that customer base. We're creating a true omni-channel experience where we don't care where they buy. We, we have a seamless experience that runs throughout. And then we're using a lot of our retail data to make the online experience better. So um, as an example, we, didn't, we launched Fabletics stores once we had 50% national brand awareness even more brand awareness than Lululemon, which has been around a lot longer. But we are doing an you know, incredible amount of TV spots. And when you think about it, they, you know, they're brick and mortar. They don't really advertise. They mostly reach audience where they have stores. Um, and then we open stores where we already have e-commerce customers. So we are, you know, we're opening them to serve the customers, but we also assume that there's a tremendous amount of customers that we haven't reached yet that are in these locations. Something we're, all, we're looking, we're also taking a really e-commerce approach to the physical store. There's a bunch of different things we do with heat mapping the stores to watch where people go, like you would a website. We look at that, we look at conversion metrics in the store, like we do e-commerce conversion metrics. But we, for every product, this is a technology that we developed that we have a patent on, for every product that goes into the uh, dressing room, we scan it and look at conversion on that product. So, we and we do it by to the individual person and to the actual product. So we can see that you know our our dash bra converted at forty percent in the in the uh, in the dressing room. We have a, our capri leggings. We convert at a, generally around twenty six percent, but we saw the extra extra small leggings. We're converting at about fourteen percent. And we couldn't, this is something we couldn't see with online data. And we realized that there was a production flaw, that the open, we, though we were decreasing the size of the leg and the opening was staying the same size. So people weren't liking that product. And it was really only through this kind of technology that we could really suss that out and address it really quickly. So um, we're using online data to affect store merchandising and the dressing room data to affect store merchandising. We're using the store data to affect uh, site merchandising. Um, we're using store data to affect customer acquisition. So we're, when someone takes some, a product into the dressing room, if we see that they liked it, uh, but maybe didn't, had to leave quickly, they may, if they're already a member, they may see that product in their, that they can put the product in their shopping cart in the dressing room and buy it online later. But we can also add retarget them online, they may be shopping on the New York Times and see an ad for something that they took into the physical dressing room, which is something that people that, that we have a patent on, people just aren't doing. And then personalized marketing, obviously, we're using all that data to constantly iterate and increase the and improve the experience. 
And it's working. We, um, same store sales are up 38% from this time last quarter, um, which is really outpacing the market. And this is just really the beginning. We, you know, if I next year, in the next couple of years, I will be here talking about how we're using augmented reality, how personalization is changing, how the Internet of Things is affecting everything, um, how mobile commerce is is in its infancy. And that's it for today. Thank you so much for having me. Wow is right. We're going to be hearing more about this tree here in just a moment. Already about a month ago, they had Christmas trees up at Costco. Who goes to Costco? Who shops there? Very wealthy people in the audience. Very, very good. We're going to be hearing about this very, very shortly. Can't get out of Costco under $500, right? Five, six hundred. Thank you very much, Sean, for that very interesting presentation. And now, ladies and gentlemen, this is a very big issue, very, very big issue coming up related to this item here. Scientists, tax collectors, attorneys, and analysts, these are just some of the hundreds of government jobs that are being created for the 2018 cannabis legalization. Yep, thousands of additional jobs are expected to be added by local governments, according to a recent article in the Los Angeles Times, come January, the state will unite its long-standing medical cannabis industry with a newly legalized recreational one, creating what will be the U.S. largest legal pot economy. Here today to talk about this and other economic impacts of the cannabis industry is Dr. Daniel Duran. One Duran, right? Dr. Daniel Duran, associate professor at Whittier College. Daniel is going to talk about the environmental and economic impacts of growing cannabis products indoors, the energy and water considerations, tax benefits locally, cost of production, and so on and so forth. He's also brought a special guest with him today. Please welcome Dr. Daniel Duran and Lisa. Well, good morning, and delighted to be here, and thank you, uh, Cal State University of Dominguez Hills. A special thanks to uh, Frank, President Hagen, uh, Marilyn McPollin, and her team for bringing this together. And this is a great opportunity to share a few facts and comments regarding the environmental and economic impact of controlled environment agriculture cannabis growing here in the Southern California region. First of all, uh, I'd like to ask us to take just a few seconds of reflection. Uh, I'm from Whittier College. We were founded by the Quakers. We start every meeting with a few moments of meditation and thought, and I think it'd be appropriate for us to do so given the recent tragedy in Las Vegas and for us to reflect for a few moments what we as a people can do to really alleviate those type of tragedies by doing something that we haven't done for decades, gun control. So if we can just take a few seconds. Thank you. I'm a professor of business administration. You say, what is a professor of business administration doing talking about uh, cannabis? Well, uh, I'm a refugee from the corporate world. I spent 25 years running international businesses in Japan, Mexico, and elsewhere. And then this thing called 9-11 erupted. I decided that day that I was going to shake off my old corporate skin and adopt a new one. That new one being to give back a little bit to the students and community that I came from. So that's why I picked Whittier College, small liberal arts school, the only uh, HSA, Title V uh, liberal arts school in the country, and one that works really closely with students. So I actually love what I'm doing, but I created my own consulting firm 15 years ago when I started uh, teaching to subsidize my teaching habit. Over the last, uh, <laughs> over the last several years, I've been working very closely with Professor Fasori seat at the table, and we've been engaged in doing research and consultation on the agricultural sector in California specifically in terms of the impact that agriculture has in terms of energy, water, and waste. Uh, to that effect, uh, we've been uh, blessed in that we've been able to interview over 250 growers throughout the state, from Calexico all the way up to the Oregon border, and we've talked to people growing vineyards, nut tree farms, row crops, rice crops, dairy farms, and other ag-based products, including some high-value crops. Our goal was very simple. Try to figure out 
what the usage patterns are, what are the best practices, and what can we, in terms of working with our state and utilities, do to make sure that we continue improving the productivity of agricultural products and make sure that we're decreasing the environmental footprint that they take up in terms of carbon dioxide, methane production, et cetera. All of that grew our most current interest. Uh, over the last uh, two years, uh, Professor Vasori and I have been focusing on urban ag, and I urge you to take a look over here at one of the poster board students has talking about the impact of urban ag in terms of healthy eating, uh, the decrease in distribution costs having to do with food. Fantastic little job they did over there. Um, one of the things we've been doing though recently is running seminars and workshops with the growers themselves, asking them what works and what doesn't work. And to that effect, we found out that there's been a significant increase in the amount of growing that's being done here in Southern California, specifically in what we call controlled environment environments. What is a controlled environment? Uh, I'll read you a formal definition. It's when growers, producers combine engineering, plant science, and computer-managed greenhouse control technologies to optimize plant growing systems, plant quality, and production efficiency. These systems allow stable control of the plant environment, including temperature, light, and carbon dioxide. It also provides separate control of the root zone environment, which I'll talk about briefly. And what it does, in essence, is to support secure, healthy, and cost-effective year-round production of many premium, edible, high-value crops. And while cannabis is not eaten, well, actually, I take that back. There are, there's more consumable cannabis in terms of food forms, et cetera. It is definitely a high value crop. And the reality is there's very precious little known about this. There was a study done by Mills at UC Berkeley about 10 years ago. Uh, Colorado Energy Commission just completed a study last year that I had, was able to get access to. And the reality is we know pathetically little about what it takes to grow this high value crop. Um, my goal in the next few minutes is to share with you a snapshot of the economic and environmental potential and impact of indoor cannabis growing. Uh, I thought it might be interesting to bring a sample over here. Uh, this is Lisa. Uh, she's got a lovely bouquet, a lovely nose. Uh, I adopted her uh, when she was 15 days old from a local grower here, uh, permitted in Southern California. She's 75 days old. She's pretty mature for her age. Uh, she's ready to really uh, get into the full blooming uh, status. And she's got about 30 days to go before she is harvested. Um, I welcome you all to come up and take a sniff or a picture as you like, but please, no hands on. You know, she's very, a very delicate stage, and we want to keep her in good shape. So uh, let's talk about the statistics, the numbers, what counts, OK? The reality is that instead of being an undercover type of product now, Cannabis is now legally grown in, uh, to support almost 60% of the United States population. And by the end of next year, we're probably talking closer to 70% of the total population. 29 states plus Washington, D.C. have medical marijuana laws. 19 states plus Washington have operating dispensaries. Eight states plus Washington have recreational mar marijuana laws. And four with operating retail licenses. Actually, five now. Okay. The point is that this is a wave that is overtaking this country, and we know pathetically little about the composition of that wave, the impact it has, not just from an economic perspective, but from an environmental perspective. So let's talk about what cannabis means in the United States there's economics. Uh, it is calculated right now uh, to have about $6 billion in annual sales. And I took Colorado. I took my spring break, went to Colorado, and visited a grow house, 15,000 square foot grow house that was grossing a million and a half a month with a 40% margin. Did you hear that? A million and a half a month with a 40% margin. And when I was there, the owner of the grow house was in Nevada uh, negotiating for distribution space to take care of the demand he anticipated with the casinos, okay? I recently spoke with him. He said that all of his distribution is dried up because they can't get through the distribution laws taking the product from uh, Colorado into Nevada. And one of the things that we're going to, have to be talking about real briefly over here. But look at the numbers, OK? Uh, Colorado in 2017, in mid-year, is 750. In 2014, it was uh, 699. 2015, 996. 2016, uh, right now, 1.3. This is a huge business, OK? A huge business that needs to be professionalized. Uh, the production averages, and just a couple of numbers over here, uh, you can get four to eight ounces of usable product per plant. Four to eight ounces, okay? Some plants are much larger, growing outdoors. Others are smaller. Uh, uh, this one has been grown uh, outdoors. My wife wouldn't let me bring it inside the house, okay? 
She claims that it disturbs her cooking process. Uh, but uh, look at the numbers here. The numbers, to me, are phenomenal. One ounce of bud retails between $200 and $250. One ounce of buds. One plant, a single plant, yields between $800 and $1,000 in product. One plant. Now, Lisa over here is a little petite. I named her after my daughter, Lisa, who is petite and potent. Uh, I don't think she's going <laughs> to provide me quite that amount. But nonetheless, I'm sure whatever it is will be more than satisfactory. <laughs> Incidentally, I do have a permit. <laughs> okay. In terms of California, though, we are the huge economic and production generator. Okay. We are the number one cannabis produced in the United States. Now, what does that mean to us from an economic perspective? Cities, Long Beach, I, I can name scores of cities, are looking at the permitting process. Okay. Right now, the average amount of taxation associated with the land itself, the property, is $15 per square foot. $15 per square foot. Okay? Local property tax. Local sales tax is anywhere from 12 to 18%. I got 15% over here. Then you have a state tax. You're talking about probably the most taxable product we will have in the state of California that has potential to generate the most revenue for cities, counties, and the state. Phenomenal. In 2016, California sales were 3.3 billion. The 2020 projection is 7.5 billion. These are huge, huge numbers. Okay. Now, uh, the quick aside over here, uh, there were a couple of reports that came out that uh, had to do with some of the discrepancies. And one of them was that in terms of California production, uh, they estimated that only 65% of the production was being consumed in state or used in state. Where's the rest of it going? It's going out of state, which brings up issues having to do with the taxation and also distribution of the product itself. Okay? So the projections are phenomenal. It is definitely a high value crop and one that's going to grow exponentially over the next several years. And what are we doing about it in terms of how we're looking at it from a permitting process, an environmental impact, and from the utilities? And I'll be talking about that real briefly. Energy. The big reality is that there's going to be a short to midterm incredible growth in consumer demand and production. No question of it. Controlled environment agriculture is the most energy efficient growing method because you can actually control the humidity levels, the temperature levels, the light levels in that type of environment to produce a high quality product that is not so much subjected to outdoor types of concerns it might have. Uh, one gram of bud per watt, that's the norm. According to the Colorado Energy Commission and the Mills Report and others, the optimum average that people are looking for is at least one gram of bud per watt. I've been to these grow houses. Typically, they're in four by four growing areas, sometimes five by five. Every four by four has at least a 400 watt uh, uh, sodium light associated with it. Okay? And uh, I've had time to show you pictures of it. Now, the reality is that the energy component in controlled environment is at least 30 to 50 percent, average is about 40 percent. 40 percent is used in energy. And how? It's used for lighting, air conditioning, air balancing, dehumidification. So a controlled environment, by definition, as I meant earlier, means that you have the ability to control what is going in in terms of the inputs on it. The other reality is that most energy choices done by growers do not reflect energy efficiency solutions. They're not going to an Edison or a PG&E or a gas company to do an audit to figure out what's the most effective way for them to be able to grow their product. A huge omission on the part of utilities, and we're hoping to work with them in the future so they can get smart. And I happen to be a utility a refugee spending 15 years with them as well, too. I know the way they think, which is pretty slow. And there is an incredible opportunity now for renewable energy generation storage. You take a look at Prop 64, one of the requirements in there is for the permitters to make sure that the growers are in fact establishing technology solutions that are 30 to 50 percent using renewable energy. So in the near future, instead of having to figure out which house is growing pot or which building is, you're going to be able to see the solar panels on top. Okay? Now, now, and from an environmental perspective, and I'm just going, giving you a quick loss over here, a quick uh, ride through it all, field production is more, far more impactful than controlled environment. Why? Because you have probably 15 to 20,000 independent individuals that are growing their stuff in Humboldt, Mendocino, Lake County, et cetera, from, more up north than down south. And there's a lot of stuff going on, a lot of practices that are going on that are not beneficial to the environment, including runoff, the, the, disposi the disposition of waste, et cetera. 
okay? Uh, the reality is that one kilogram of the product, the finished product, is equivalent to 4,600 kilograms of carbon dioxide. There's a huge carbon footprint associated with indoor cannabis growing. And one of the challenges we have is to figure out how to manage that aspect of it. Uh, there's a potential for nutrients runoff. Uh, now, the grow house I saw in uh, Colorado, they just showed me a group of new uh, water filtration systems that will be able to uh, uh, allow them to put in nutrients and other components to enhance the growing. And it was $35,000 to equip four four by four sections. The point is that there's incredible opportunities here for the technologies, for the lighting people, the water people, the reverse osmosis people, et cetera. There's no question there's better use and efficiency in controlled environment. And the reality is, too, that with controlled environment agriculture, you're in a position now to really create almost a whole line of boutique products for individuals because you're able to get that exact type of product that you want with exact characteristics, uh, both the chemical as well as the psychological, et cetera, to be able to attract individuals. And that's going to be a huge thing. To me, it's like the end of prohibition uh, in the 1920s, okay, where people were trying to figure out how we're going to manage this. We're in that same, posi same position. The dam is breaking loose in terms of how we're going to have to deal with this. So what are some of the opportunities over here? Okay, number one, there are huge opportunities for cities to get smart about how they permit these facilities in terms of where they're permitted, the, the type of technology they're going to use, the type of systems they intend to implement, et cetera, how they're going to handle water, how they're going to handle waste, et cetera. So huge, and the tax opportunities are phenomenal. That's why many of the cities in the desert are looking at in, in, indoor cannabis growing as being the single biggest generator of revenue for them, bar none, even more so than the hospitality and resort industry over there. Okay? Number two, huge range of employment opportunities from basic to technical. Basic to technical. And I'm dealing with two uh, opportunities right now where uh, charitable organizations are working with uh, individuals with PTSD and other issues, and they're helping them to train so they can work in greenhouse type environments. What a more optimal greenhouse environment than this, okay? Current federal regulations and laws restrict financial transactions. We're all aware of that. But I read here today that there's a, a, there's a move in the state of California to develop a new bank, and specifically one here in Los Angeles, that will allow the transactions to occur between growers, distributors, and customers. Because right now, who wants to take a big wad of cash into a, a dispensary? Okay? No formal certified training programs for growers, distributors, and retailers. Total lack. Okay? And my time is up. Let me just say that there's no question in my mind that this is a boom that we need to control and get in front of early. Utilities need to, cities need to, growers need to, distributors need to. Thank you. And of course, after a discussion on cannabis, it only follows to have a discussion about food, so <laughs> we appreciate the organizers' foresight here. Let's bring in our final speaker now, Kyle Ransford, CEO with Sheft, an El, an El Segundo-based company, Sheft, is a meal delivery service, and Kyle will talk about global meal kits and share with us who the future players will be for this market. Kyle, thank you very much. Thank you all for having me. Be careful giving entrepreneurs mics. They'll keep you in your seats. Um, so uh, I want to share a little bit about meal kits uh, and the future of meal kits and how they are going to play in food e-commerce and, and, and where things are likely going in the future and what the possibilities are here for the South Bay as one of the, one of the companies here in the South Bay. But show of hands, how many of you know what a meal kit is? How many of you have tried a meal kit? How many of you know what Blue Apron is? How many of you have ever heard of Chef? All right, well, we're going to try to change some more of that piece. We have a slightly different business model that doesn't include spend, taking a whole bunch of money and spending and throwing it out there uh, for free. We try to have a great product and let people uh, refer, refer each other than, than having big marketing budgets. But we'll get, we'll, we'll get into that. Um, so for those of you that don't know, a meal kit is ordering just exactly what what, what a, ordering just exactly what you're going to have to make that meal. So I get a teaspoon of this, a tablespoon of that, a cup of this and this and that. You know, in, in the 1950s, mom was really man, was making 20 out of 21 meals at home, manage an inventory. I have 200 different things that are going perishable. I'm going to the grocery store. They're selling me family sizes. What price should I get? Should I invest in that inventory? Are we going to use it? Are we going to have left overnight? A lot of cognitive load going on in mom's poor head. And she was planning, you know, meals, you know, half of the time of her, half of the time of her life. Mom's quit, um, and she's done with that. So, 
so we're trying to find services for, 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 today, for today's world. So the, um, the meal kit industry has sprung up around that of like, just tell me exactly what I'm gonna make right here, awesome. The first people in the, in the space went to the subscription model, All the venture guys go, oh, you have to be subscription, we know how to do that, because if they, we buy them for 20 bucks, they'll buy it 12 times, we'll make 100, easy, MBA math, no problem. The only challenge is uh, we didn't have a subscription to our grocery store in the idea that one company is gonna pick for a million people in the country the three things that they want. I'm like, my wife can't pick the three things that I want next week and she knows me pretty well, right? So, uh, you know, that was the in entry part of the, of the business. We came along a little bit later as the innovator. So you might've heard of Blue Apron, Plated, HelloFresh, some of these companies that started about five years ago. Uh, we started uh, just three years ago. We've been selling food for about two and a half years. It's been a rocket ship ride. We are, though, hundreds of meals to choose from, from the people you trust, personalized for you, much in the, in the commentary of other e-commerce things that you, you've heard. So we have today over uh, 1,200 different choices of meals in two and four servings, uh, largely from brands that you would know, Weight Watchers, New York Times, Celebrity Chefs, Atkins. So this slide, it's growing really fast. Food e-commerce is here to stay for all the reasons that we heard about uh, food e-commerce. I want to order it on my phone, all, the, all, all, all those pieces. You're seeing, f you know, food is is kind of the last frontier of e-commerce. It's the biggest portion of the economy. Food is basically a trillion dollar business in our economy. Online's $20 billion today, uh, uh, a nothing kind of number, uh, or was in 2016, 2017, you know, you, the food e-commerce will double. You're not seeing those kind of growth rates in other parts of going online because it's the last frontier to go online. Uh, and you can see the stats there. Meal kits as a portion of that uh, are estimated to grow at 36 billion. Um, having followed these numbers, everyone's always been off by about a factor of a half of their projections. This concept and idea that I didn't invent, uh, is, it was invented in Sweden actually, uh, or the marketing of it was invented in Sweden, um, it is taking off so much because the consumer is really seeing it as a better value. So who the brands are, where I'm gonna buy it from, this and that, but this investing in inventory, we've all had the experience, you go to the grocery store to make dinner, and you walk out and you're like, why did it cost 70 bucks to make dinner? Like, and then you go, oh, well I got toilet paper. Okay, well I guess I gotta go home and make dinner. Man, maybe we, maybe we should've gone out for 60 bucks. Like, um, the reason is you're buying all the wrong sizes and food waste is stuff's getting thrown away and environmental issues, all these things that we've, we've heard of. The meal kit is a solution, is a solution for that. Where you buy the meal kit uh, will change over time, but um, the market is growing rapidly, basically because this consumer sees it as a better value. Uh, you know, I sort of say when iPhone 8 comes out, if it's better than iPhone 7 and cheaper than iPhone 7, why would anyone ever buy iPhone 7? Um, you're finding a lot of consumers thinking that about meal kits. Um, that was backwards, let's go forward. No backwards. Uh, I, I presupposed mom, there's mom. She's trying to figure out what ingredients, where to go, this and that. Ordering it online, click of a button, it shows up at my door, much simpler. I quit. Um, you're, you're finding, again, if you look at, so we took one of our, our, our most popular meal is uh, two-person beef bourguignon. The reason it's the most popular meal is because it's been on our menu the longest. The most people have tried it, the most people are like, hey, that was pretty good, they, and then they reorder it. We're the only service in the meal kit space where you can actually reorder the things that you like, uh, which is an interesting thing to try to market to consumers because you just kind of assume, well, if I like it, I can buy it again. Uh, in meal kits, because the industry grew up on venture capital money and subscription models, they're giving you three, net, three, three new ones next week. You know, the other companies are trying to evolve around that, but we've evolved a totally different system in order to give you choice and give you the opportunity to order at any time. We basically have a grocery store of small sizes. But So we looked at our meal there. Uh, if you went to Whole Foods and you bought it, you can see, well, I get a lot of extra stuff. Did I want that extra stuff is for you know an extra 20 bucks or is that or 30 bucks? Is that worth getting the big sack of potatoes, a whole thing of wine, and you know a bag of flour, etc.? And if you eat out, um, and then you know ordering through Postmates and having it delivered, it's awesome when they deliver it. But they're again they're delivering me the wrong sizes, right? So most most of this is about getting down to just buy, let me buy just exactly what I need. We're the innovator in the space. Everybody else started with the subscription. We kind of looked at it and said, well, we're gonna fund this ourselves, so we're not tied to these venture capitalists and what they have to say. What does the consumer actually want? 
And, you know, it's like, well, I actually want to choose what I'm going to eat. I actually want to eat, make what I already know how to make. And so most, you know, every piece of data says households have seven kind of to 10 things that they have in rotation and they change one or two a year. But like, if I know how to make it, just get it again and let's do it again. So we're very focused on that, that side of e-commerce and having you be, have all the options to order it whenever you want. So Chef is a value added platform um, that is kind of capitalizing on the shared economy concept. So there's a bunch of big brands in, uh, you know, that could be the, the, that we do business with, Nestle's, Mars, Campbell's, Hershey's, these types of big companies that we've all heard of that want to get their products to you. Influencers, celebrity chefs, um, emerging young brands, trendsetters, they all have consumers that already know them, but they have no way to get the food to them. So we're the first people to put together a direct-to-consumer cold chain. So if you want to get fresh food to somebody on a national basis, we're the only door right now. And if you think uh, many people, any, any business you're in, you have to think about, can we compete with Amazon? The difference between us and Amazon is they're doing regionally. So we have Amazon Fresh in Southern California. But if you go on vacation in Lake Arrowhead or you live in Lake Arrowhead, you can't get Amazon Fresh. Um, I'm hoping that you know you get my point. The um, and so they have a regionalized approach. Many of our big brand partners, they're too big a companies. You know, uh, New York Times, Weight Watchers can't have you go to their site and say, oh, we'll put in your address and we'll see if we send it to you. Like there are companies that are past that 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 kind of stage. So we do half, about half of our business is actually selling products for other people. Um, some of the other brands that you've heard, we we are the distribution arm for as well. So we're both a services company at, as well as a product company. Uh, we have 120 different partners that we, we uh, fulfill for. So when you come to our site, our goal is to have a product for everybody, right? So if you're, you, you know, you're on a, uh, ADA is a great partner of ours. If that's a medical place for you, we have, we have offerings for you. Hey, if, if you're trying to get, uh, you know, get after it, the beef burger is great. Um, uh, we are trying to be the buy button anywhere that you see a recipe online. So our next stage will be, hey, I see this recipe. Like, that sounds good. Pff, buy it. Like, and, and have those ingredients come to you. Um, so whether it's sold on Amazon, our site, every other site out there. Uh, retail, I'm, I'm going to catch up and not be the one. Retail is coming. So uh, like any good internet company, we're, of course, going to brick and mortar. So uh, <laughs> and, and this concept that there's internet companies and there's brick and mortar companies, it's like, no, no, no. There's just companies building brands, and they're going to start online, they're going to go to retail, and then they're going to try to drive you back online. That's the new world. Um, and so you'll be able to buy some kits on, in the store online in a media kind of piece, but you'll never have the mass customization piece that, that you can have online. What we're really playing for is the mass customization we call grandma's meatball recipe, where you could put up your own recipe and buy just exactly what you want. So it's great that, you know, this amazing chef has his way of making spaghetti and meatballs, but this is how we make spaghetti and meatballs. And I want a teaspoon and a tablespoon and this and that. I save it, I one touch, order it, and it's there. So the whole world is going to the phone, the one touch. If you could have your seven recipes that you make at home saved here, and then you just went one, one two, order two meals and four touches is, is, is our mantra. Have it, have it show up the next day. So uh, that's the future of what we think is possible. We, we're super excited to be here in El Segundo in the South Bay. In three years, we have 350 people uh, and uh, looking to grow that substantially. All right, Beef Bourguignon sounds good right about now. <laughs> Unfortunately, our time has wrapped up, so just enough time here to say a huge thank you to the great audience and all of our speakers and today's presentations and the South Bay Economic Forecast Report will be available later today on the CSU Dominguez Hills website. On behalf of Cal State University Dominguez Hills, I want to thank you very much for joining us here this morning, and we hope you'll share what you've learned here at the South Bay Economic Forecast and encourage others to join us at next year's event. I want to thank Marilyn McPoland and Amy Bentley-Smith for the fantastic organization and support here. And uh, President Willie J. Hagan, thank you very much for the family treatment as always. I don't know if you heard, but uh, President Hagan will be hanging up the sword at the end of this academic year. So we want to conclude by thanking President Hagan for all the great years of service here on the campus and a huge standing ovation for President Hagan. Thank you very, very much.